six o'clock. Uh, Chris is going to be taking our minutes. I just want to let um, everyone know that the chat feature should be disabled at this point. Is that correct, Patrick? I'm not sure if it is, but I will attempt to disable it. Okay. <clears throat> Um, and the reason for that is in light of some com um, comments made from a community member and doing a little research, it's probably in our best interest to avoid violating open meeting laws um, by having that chat running throughout the meeting. So we're going to shut it right off and avoid that, even a potential for violating. You see that um, Neat TV says that they are want somebody to record for them. I'm recording right now, so I can, I'll send that link to Sean. I did see it. Okay. And I think I disabled chat. Let's check it out quick. I think as panelists, you might be able to. It said attendees can chat with no one, I think is what I just turned on, so. Okay. We probably, should, there's no way for it to, to cut I us didn't out. See, I did not see an option to turn chat off entirely. That was the only option I saw that seemed okay. close to what we were trying to do. Okay. Well, board members, just a reminder that you should not be using the chat in the course of the meeting because that becomes a public document that would have to be included in our minutes. Okay. All right. And I'll keep watching the, uh, the attendees, Don, for board members showing up. Okay. Thank you. All right, is there any public comment at this time? And folks that are attendees, if you have public comment, if you can use the electronic hand raise feature, then that'll let me know that you have something to say and we can call on you. Hey, Deirdre. Hi everyone, good evening. Hi. Um, thanks for being, thanks for all the work you're doing. I, I didn't mention it last time, but just want to say thank you. I feel like the COVID time is sort of unbelievable towards everyone and particularly the school and what I hear from students and parents from elementary to high schools that people are working really, really hard. So thank you. And I know that there was so much work in the summer too around that. Um, I just had a question. This was a, something was brought up in the winter time and, um, I know that the central office right now is being rented out at um, about $50,000 a year, which is real money, but it's also small in this whole big picture of what we're talking about. Um, when we talked about it last time, last winter, there was a conversation about maybe we look at it over the spring or summer, some questions of whether that's really good use of our time to make that shift. And um, as someone who thinks it's a good idea, both monitoring every time we can shave off $50,000, I think it's a really good idea. Plus I think, Philosophically, it's a really good idea as a community to say we're doing everything we can to, to kind of uh, to shave off the top so that we can keep as much services for students and parents and teachers there. So I wonder if that's something that the board has thought about doing for the upcoming budget. And, and my thought is moving into like the high school, for example, or maybe there's another idea you've all thought about. We don't typically answer in, in public comment, but um, uh, in the course of the next couple of months, that question may be answered in one way or another through our discussion. Okay. Um, thank you, Don. Is there, um, with public comments, is there a time when there can be question and answer that happened that the community can get answers? Um, answers? Uh, not usually. Um, in this time frame, because we are limit, we limit the, the uh, length of the time. But um, sometimes uh, people send questions, you know, in an email, and um, you can get an answer back personally, um, one on one. If 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 it you know it doesn't involve a ton of research or you know putting somebody um, on it for hours and hours. Mm -hmm. And if I can interject for a second, Don, I think, you know, part of the conversations that have happened over the years through policy governance is recognizing that board meetings are, are 
sort of sacred time for the board to do board work. And separate from that, it's really important to create opportunities for community engagement and discourse. I think kind of like what you're what you're seeking, Deirdre. So that's I think that has been intentional um, to have the design as such to to enable board work to happen and community engagement to happen. But it gets a little tricky trying to do both in the same meeting. All right. Are you all set, Deirdre? Before I, I want to move on to someone else, if you're, if you had more. I'm all set for now. I think I would just love to think about how to um, honor that need to do work and also how we can, I know there's lots of community engagement, but I think it's tough if there's not opportunity to do some back and forth in the community. So I don't, I don't have the answer tonight and you're all doing it, but I would love to think about that as we have short amount of time between now and March. Um, with that. So that's just, that's a question and I'll, I'll leave with that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And Chris, I see your hand up. You can go ahead and unmute. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Um, I can only see board members and Katrina and Patrick and Floyd and Susan. Are there other members? Uh, Attending that I need for the minutes. Other public, yeah, I got Deirdre. Yes, there are a list. I don't know if you can see attendees. If you look at the the participants down below. I don't have that you option. Don't see participants, okay. Sorry. I don't know if you can take like a screenshot and email it to me later on. I don't wanna make this cumbersome, but I wanna keep the minutes. I'm, I'm happy to email them to Chris right now. Thanks, Katrina. You're welcome. Okay, great. And I want to make sure a couple of board members have come in. So let me get them or at least one board member. Okay, I don't see any other hands up. I'm guessing we're good. Okay, great. And we'll move down to the consent agenda. I need a motion to accept the consent agenda. So moved, Andrew. Andrew, is there a second? Second. All right, Kristen, Blanchett, second. All right, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Thumbs up helps too. <laughs> then I know I got y'all. <laughs> All right. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Okay. Next, we're moving down to executive limitations monitoring report. A1 and A2. Um, so we start with a couple of discussion oh. items here, where, which is okay. unusual for the order. Uh, but we have a couple of presenters today. Yep, I'm sorry. I didn't print out the updated agenda. I printed out the first one. Okay, so next up on, on the one I'm looking at, Don, is a discussion of the Career Center budget. Is that what yes. you're seeing? Yes, right. that is what I'm seeing. Sorry, okay. I printed out the... All right. And for that, we have Dana Peterson uh, on with us. So with your permission, I'll promote him to panelists so that he can present the Career Center budget and sure. information. Great. Thank you. All right, Dana, you should be able to share video and audio now. Are you there, Dana? Can you hear me now? <laughs> All right. Seems like I don't know if Dana's having some technical difficulties. Maybe we can move on to the next agenda item and try to buy some time for Dana and we'll check back in. 
Let's Could we try and all mute possibly? There's just kind of some background hum. There we go. Dana, are you there now? Did that help anything? All right, we're getting nothing out of Dana, so let's go ahead and move on in the agenda, I suppose, if you're all right with that, Don? Sure. Okay. Uh, so so next up, go ahead. what's that? Don, I think the uh, feedback is on your end. I wish I knew sign language. <laughs> All right, so next agenda item is another is also a presentation. Um, there's a, a group of there's a, a couple of really student groups that are working uh, on raising the Black Lives Matter flag at Mount Abe. And it was important for them to have an audience with the board to talk their thinking through on that. Um, so I'll turn it over to Shannon Warden, principal at Mount Abe, and I'll let her um, introduce folks and I'll be working to allow them into the meeting as she's introducing. So here comes Shannon. Hi everybody, thank you for having us. So while Patrick works on promoting um, everyone, um, I will just kind of preface this by saying, um, Thank you for having us. This has been truly a collaborative effort that the kids will really talk about between um, our community council, which they're going to describe to you, um, a group of educators at the middle and high school that have formed um, kind of an organic diversity and equity committee to help promote um, diversity and equity learning in the school, um, as well as the Mount Abraham Student Activism Group. Um, so while Patrick is letting um, folks on, we had a number of students who were not able to be here tonight, and that was the majority of our executive committee of the community council, just because of other engagements. They are very, very busy kids. Um, so we spent a little time to make a recording, though, so that they could introduce themselves and explain what community council is in case you aren't familiar, um, as well as um, explain the proposal process and what the initial proposal was and why we are here with you um, this evening. And then I'm going to introduce some other folks that are slowly popping into the room, but um, in the interest of saving time, I'll play that video now while Patrick continues to promote the others. So if you give me just one second, I'll share my screen. Patrick, will you give me permission to share my screen? Oh, yes. yes. Thank you. Hmm, if I can figure out how. Being the host of these webinars is very challenging to navigate all the pieces. <laughs> well, I'm not seeing an option of your window or screen share. I can make you host. Maybe I can do that and then you can make me host back. Sure. Because I don't think I see anyone else in the attendees list. So let's try the making you host and then making me host again. Okay. Does that so, work? Yes. So I'm going to share my screen now. And this is um, a video of some community council members who could not be here this evening. Hello, I am Angelita Pena. I am a sophomore and from Moncton, and I'm also the moderator of Community Council. Hello, my name is Sean Davison. I'm the clerk for executive committee and the, a so one of the sophomore representatives on Community Council. Hi, I'm Karen Meyer from New Haven. I'm a junior and I'm a class of 22 representative and the communicator on the executive committee. Council is a student-led group that forms the governing body at Mount Abraham. We are comprised of faculty, community, and school board members, as well as teachers and students. 
our goal is to have a positive impact on our school while helping individual voices to be heard. We, together, we discuss and vote on proposals. Proposals are student, teacher, and community member submissions. These submissions are filtered by the executive committee to either the admin team or community council. When community council receives one of the proposals, the first thing we do is invite the person who submitted the proposal to our meetings. When they arrive and we're all set up and ready to go, we talk to them for almost the majority of the meeting often. We ask them questions and make sure we know both sides of the proposal, whether it's a good idea or whether it's not a good idea. We make sure that we have a firm understanding. We make sure that every member has a firm understanding of what the proposal would do for our school environment. After asking questions and being discussing the proposal, we meet again to make sure that we are in a good place after the first meeting and that we have a firm understanding of what the proposal means for our school. On the second meeting, we have the opportunity to vote for the proposal. If the majority rules, we move forward with the proposal and accept it. We do what the community council can to help the person who submitted the proposal continue to work on the proposal. Dean, we received and accepted a proposal in support of the Black Lives Matter movement, and I will read the issue at hand that we were given. It is imperative that our school conveys its stance in anti-hate movements. With Mount Ape's lack of voice on anti-racism, it may not be clear to students or community members that as a school, we will not tolerate discrimination, hate speech, or any other divisive actions. The proposed solution was for us to raise a Black Lives Matter flag in front of our school. And by doing this, we would show our support for the Black Lives Matter movement and that we do not condone hate speech, discrimination, or racism. By doing this, we would show the community that we support any of our minority citizens and that we are educating our students about racial injustice and racism in our country and around the world. All right, so I believe everybody's here. So I'm just gonna quickly call on them. And um, when I call your name, if you can just unmute and let everybody know who you are, give a wave. Um, and we're going to start with, I'm just gonna read right off my list, Ms. Osborne, so I don't miss anybody. Kelly Osborne, are you here? Yeah, I'm here, sorry, hello. Um, so Kelly Osborne is one of our um, English teachers and she's on the diversity and equity committee. Um, Ms. Fern Aguda Brown, are you here with us? I am, yeah. I'm Fern. I'm the workspace learning coordinator at Monib and a member of the diversity and equity committee. Great, thank you, Fern. Um, Karen Norwood? Hey, I'm Karen Norwood. I'm a social studies teacher and I'm also the teacher representative on the executive committee of community council. Thank you. And April Wartman. Hi everyone. I'm the director of school counseling and supports at Mount Eve. I am a member of the diversity and equity committee and I'm also a member of the community council. Thank you. Abby Johnson. Hi, can everyone hear me? Great. Yeah, so I'm Abby Johnson. I'm a junior from Starksboro, and I'm a member of MASA and a 11th grade and 11th grade um, representative on community council. Thank you. Anna Doucette, are you with us? Yes. Hi, my name is Anna Doucette. I am a member of MASA and I use she, her pronouns. Thank you, Anna. And Isabel Galvan. Hi, I'm Isabel. I'm a freshman at um, I'm a member of MASA and I use Thanks, Isabel. It, we're having a little bit of a hard time to hear you. So maybe when it's your turn to speak, you could turn your video off and maybe that will help with your audio. So I'm going to turn it over to the kids who have put together um, some talking points for you. So basically community council has already accepted 
the proposal um, in, in 2018 to raise the Black Lives Matter flag and what these different organizations um, that exist within Mount Abe have done is come together in a very collaborative effort to provide the education for our faculty, staff, students, and community around what it means to raise the flag, um, which we will do once that process of learning um, is complete in this time frame, knowing that it's really a lifelong process of learning. Um, and we would raise the flag for 30 days. So I am going to turn it over to the students who have um, prepared some things that, um, that they would like to share with you. Great. Um, okay, so we're going to be sharing a quick piece that Anna Doucette, Isabel Galvin, and myself put together. Um, and so yeah, let me just get it up. And then I'll begin and you'll hear from the rest of us as well. Okay. We believe that Mount Abraham needs to put more effort into becoming an actively anti-racist institution. We believe that action steps such as educational resources, diverse curriculum, and the elevation of local Black, Indigenous, people of color's voices will aid in this endeavor. This supports the original proposal passed by Community Council in 2018. We must, can everyone hear me before I start? Yeah. Okay. We must show actionable support for our BIPOC or Black Indigenous people of color students. Living in a majority white state like Vermont, it can be easy to dismiss, dismiss the diversity we have with things like saying, oh, we don't have many Black people here. And this diminishes the existence of BIPOC Vermonters and reduces our capacity to elevate their voices. We must challenge the notion that we don't have here and that racism is not prevalent throughout our state. As a majority white state, it can be hard to see the deeply racist policies, attitudes, and environments within Vermont, but they are ones that BIPOC are confronted with every day. If we find ourselves saying that there are not enough BIPOC voices at the table, we must challenge ourselves by asking why. Is money fostering an environment that is conducive to acknowledgement and celebration of BIPOC? Raising the Black Lives Matter flag is both an act of symbolism and symbolic, but let it be symbolic of what is to come. Because the raising of this flag barely scratches the surface of the real work that needs to be done, Becoming anti-racist individually, not to mention collectively, is a lifelong, never-ending process. One that involves constant education, challenge, and change of our implicit bias, misunderstandings, and social norms. It is also important to note what the flag does not mean. It does not mean that all lives do not matter. Rather, it means that right now, we need to make a concerted effort to show that BIPOC lives matter, because historically and presently, our policies and institutions show that they do not. When BIPOC lives matter, only then all lives will matter. We are spending this month in advisory circles learning about the importance of inclusivity, identity, and systemic racism. We hope to continue this work past the raising of the flag, and we hope that our community will join us in our effort to make Mount Abe an even stronger school. In a time of such polarization and hate, BIPOC students deserve to feel safe, protected, and celebrated. Because their safety is intertwined with ours, their happiness is intertwined with ours, their victories are intertwined with ours. We must continue to fight for collective liberation at Mount Abe and in the greater community. Because in the words of Rajni Eddins, black poet, facilitator, activist, and Burlington resident, quote, my liberation is tied with yours, end quote. Thank you students, you did a great job. So uh, we know that you have a very full agenda, but we would certainly um, be welcome to answer any questions and are certainly available after this meeting to answer questions as well and can share our materials um, with board members if they're interested to see the learning that um, we are taking um, part in at Mount Abraham. I have a, I have a question. Um, how can the board support uh, the student group in this process? A great question and I will let the students answer that. Well, I think it's just gonna be a matter of making sure that the support is outward and public. I think, especially if there is um, kind of clap back from the community, it's gonna be important that we put forward a united front as a school community. 
and show that we are not, this is really important to us and it is something that we are going to keep pushing for despite the controversy surrounding the issue. It is something that matters. It's something that is important. And I think in whatever ways possible to make sure that everybody in our school feels supported, whether that end up being through other policies that we might need to enact at our school and just showing public support. I just, what further steps do you guys need to take? And I have to say, I was at Winooski High School today and they fly that flag and I was very moved by seeing that. And I was surprised that I was so moved by it. Further steps in raising the flag or further steps um, after the flag to continue anti Um, I guess both. Yeah. Um, well, in terms of aside from the flag, um, I mentioned a couple, but really only briefly. A big one is curriculum changes. I know that a lot of English teachers over the summer had been getting together and talking about how they can integrate um, more black authors into their reading lists. Um, but I, I'm hoping that Massa and Community Council and the Diversity and Equity Committee after this, we can actually really take a look at really like the specifics of our curriculum and is it balanced enough? Is there enough emphasis on the history and also the present day issues because I think it's you know it's one thing to learn about the history which is so so important but it's another thing to understand that racism is still with us and that we still have a role in dismantling it um so curriculum would be the main thing that I would emphasize Anna what are what are some others um well I absolutely agree with that and I think just to add to keep this conversation going at the school I think it's easy with everything happening in the media right now the Black Lives Matter movement is very prevalent and very out in the open although I think that it's going to come down to keeping the conversation going even when Black Lives Matter is not a trend anymore our school cannot stop because Black Lives are going to continue to matter and I think it's really important that we don't let that die away and that we make sure everybody knows that this is something that we have to keep doing for our whole lives as white people it's not something that we can just forget about because these are people's lives that we're talking about. So just keeping a conversation going is really important. Uh, and then another thing I had been thinking about, this is just a brainstorm idea, but um, you know, bringing more local BIPOC voices into our school to talk with us about anything really, but just br like trying to gain, I think as a majority white school, a lot of students just don't have a lot of exposure um, to BIPOC influences, role models, et cetera, and maybe just trying to loop in some of these amazing BIPOC people that we have in Vermont, Rajni Eddins, for example, um, would be really nice. And right now, because of COVID, that's not really possible, but I hope that in the future, that could be something we could explore. Isabel, you got bumped out for a minute. Was there anything that you wanted to add? Could you ask that question one more time here at the beginning? If the, the question was um, about what what are our next steps and what what's coming next? So like for the raising of the flag and beyond, what do we see as what what is yet to come for Mount Abe and our work with diversity and equity? I think I agree um, with Abby and Anna, like, um, like changing our curriculum, um, uh, making it much more diverse than it is right now, um, and also, you know, diversifying, like, if we have speakers or people come in. Um, they're that as well. Great, thank you, Isabel. Thank you, and thank you for doing that work. It's really important. Thank you. It is, and we really appreciate your support. We um, we used your, Liz shared um, the statement that you all put out over the summer, and we used that in some of our work to prepare for, for this and the work with the school, and we'll be using that um, for the messaging that Community Council will share out um, in collaboration with the other groups um, for the greater Mount Abraham community as well. So thank you very much for, um, for all of your support and for having us this evening. And Patrick, I'm going to pass the host back over to you.
Thank you very much. And also thank you for preparing that video. That was really great that you guys were able to pull that together. Thank you guys for doing this. Thank you. Okay, I think I have host privileges back. Thank you, Shannon. And thank you also students, uh, adult faculty supporters. Uh, it is difficult and really important work and you're demonstrating a lot of leadership as a group um, in this work. It's much appreciated. So we'll go back and see if we have Dana on the line now. There's Dana. Hi, Patrick. Sorry, technical difficulties. Play <laughs> it's the world we live in now. It's all right. <laughs> well, I, I was uh, <clears throat> uh, feeling a little bit supported in the fact that you were having your own little challenges at the beginning. So, anyway, <clears throat> so let me know what, how we want to proceed. The floor is yours, Dana. Uh, so I'll, I'll introduce you. Dana Peterson is the director of the Patricia A. Hannaford Regional Technical Center. Did I get it right, Dana? You did. All right. Um, Thanks, Patrick. Uh, and he's here to share a little bit of information uh, about the Career Center and ongoings there, um, and to share a little bit of foresight into the budget building process for the Career Center. Uh, so do you want me to just uh, talk and present, or do you want or and present the information, or would you like me to share a screen, or how would you like to proceed? If you have a presentation that you'd like to share, uh, you can certainly I have share. a brief PowerPoint that I could go over that would at least give you some reference points. Sure. And do you see, do you have a screen sharing option currently? I do. Post disabled participant screen sharing. Okay. Uh, let's try. Oh, I can do it now. There we go. Let's see if I can do this. Okay, can you still see me? Yep. No, you're seeing my screen. Yes, we see your screen. All right, let me just get this started then. All right. So actually you're seeing my notes, that's okay. <laughs> I've got dual. Um, screens here. So anyway, you can see what we uh, have on here. And uh, this is just a budget overview. It's very preliminary, um, set for uh, Mount Abe this evening. And I just wanted to share uh, a little bit about my myself. Once again, I have uh, have teach 15 years of teaching experience, and I've been in a leadership for 20 plus. Uh, I am the director and superintendent here at uh, PAHCC. And I just want to say welcome to everybody and thank you for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to present to you. So just a few highlights from uh, this school year. Uh, I know it's been a very different school year. So some of the things that I'll focus on are a little different than a usual uh, presentation for the start of a school year. But um, we have four days, of, uh, four days a week in-person uh, instruction for our uh, pre-tech and technical program students. For um, the technical pro program students, they come every day except Wednesday. Uh, they do remote access on Wednesday and our pre-tech students uh, are on an alternating day schedule. So they actually come uh, either two, they usually come two days a week because Wednesdays is also a remote day for, for them depending on their uh, rotation, which we've tried to work out and coordinate with our uh, partner schools. So we have 80 uh, plus percent of the students in person uh, on those four days. Uh, we have a small number of remote students and uh, those students are supported in a variety of different uh, ways uh, with uh, remote access. Sometimes they have uh, uh, real-time access to uh, classrooms through um, Zoom and or uh, Google Meet. Uh, other times they're just uh, accessing um, their materials remotely, it depends on the circumstance. Um, we're working to serve all of the students from our partner schools all over Addison County and beyond. Uh, we have uh, quite a few different uh, towns represented and we have three counties besides, I mean, two other counties besides Addison County, we have Rutland County and uh, Chittenden also representing our student numbers for this year. 
Our, our student organizations are, are starting up and they're doing uh, quite a bit of, of work and planning and they're doing some remote meetings. Uh, the focus this year is on some entrepreneurship and the students are actually uh, looking at ways that they can interact with the, uh, the community in a variety of different uh, ways, uh, including uh, sales from our culinary program, uh, where people will take orders and our culinary students will uh, prepare them, especially for them. Uh, we've got a number of uh, partners out in the community that are uh, interested and engaged in helping us um, continue our good work. And we are uh, placing students in, uh, still placing students in our co-op opportunities, uh, but they must follow, they must agree to follow the uh, strict standards that we have in place here at the school in order for our students to be placed with them. Um, we have found that the students have been very cooperative and collaborative. Uh, we are getting very little uh, resistance to any of our guidelines that we need to follow, and, and they're working uh, very hard to remind each other uh, about the importance of uh, health and safety. And the students are very engaged and appreciative of the time uh, to be applying themselves in hands-on work this year. Perhaps I've heard more uh, comments this year uh, about the value of their opportunities here at the Career Center than in uh, years past. They seem to be very appreciative of what we're doing um, to help them in this particular difficult situation and circumstances. Um, with respect to our budget, and this is a very preliminary uh, view, um, we have a, a total expense budget last year of 3864751 and we still have a lot of work to do, but uh, we have already identified $75,000 worth of, uh, of savings uh, in the, the budget. So uh, although this is really very preliminary, uh, we're starting out with a number that we know is uh, pretty solid, and that's um, right now 3789000 um, So we're very pleased at the ability to be able to identify uh, those savings and pass them on to the, our member districts. Uh, we haven't gotten our revenues yet. Those haven't been projected at this time. We expect to have those uh, sometime by uh, the beginning of December. Uh, but for our presentation tonight and for our conversations at our next uh, board meeting, we're assuming that all of those revenues will be very similar uh, in FY22 to FY23. Um, our estimated tuition assessments, this will uh, be welcome news to um, many of our partner districts. Uh, if we're assuming a similar revenue allocation and we deduct those revenues from the total, the total overall budget costs, then uh, we come up with our, our tuition costs as they're assessed on a six semester average and I've done some calculations here. So, um, Please remember that these payments are always for students that will not be at uh, the career center at the time that we're uh, paying for. So what we're calculating next year is your uh, rate to be able to understand what uh, Mount A will be responsible for in terms of the, uh, the assessment. So by uh, these calculations for next year in FY22, we take uh, the amount to be raised by taxes uh, when we was taken off the, the revenues, and that I didn't put in there because they're, they're assumed to be the similar to last year. Uh, but that would mean raising taxes of 1874848 We divide by our six semester average, which is calculated currently at 129.12. That still needs to be uh, validated by AOE, uh, but we have a reason to believe that that's a fairly uh, accurate number. And that would bring the uh, tuition, uh, assessed tuition, to 14,520. Um, the state will make a payment to us uh, on behalf, and that's approximately this is the same rate as last year. We don't know what that is going to be, uh, but if uh, there's usually a, a small multiplier that would increase that, but keeping it at last year's, that means that our total cost uh, next year for our tuition would be uh, 23,710. And that compares to our tuition rate for this year of 25,503. So it's $1,800 uh, lower on the aggregated um, 
for people to read. Cost per FTD. Um, we have not updated our enrollment trends completely because our numbers are not um, finalized. Uh, but we had an uptick in our six semester, and our six semester average is also uh, climbing. So that is uh, that is a very positive sign uh, for engagement in career and technical education countywide in Madison County. The uh, six semester average uh, in the past seven years that average has fluctuated between. 123 and 135, so 129.12 is at the upper end of uh, that range. Actually, it's right in the middle of that range, I guess. Uh, exactly. Uh, uh, six either way. In the fall of 2015, there was a high of 153. Last year, we had 147 in the fall and 140 in the spring. Our current FTE semester count is 126.49. Um, in August, we had FTEs of 140, um, very similar to what we experienced last year. Um, but when we had a, a variety of schedule changes that we couldn't uh, align with because our partner schools were doing things differently, um, we ended up losing approximately 15 FTEs um, in that process. That's unfortunate. We hope to be able to get back to a uh, coordinated schedule such as we had last year with all uh, three of our partner schools uh, sending students at the same, um, same schedule at the same time. Uh, in the spring of 2017, we had uh, a low of 111 FTEs. And uh, next, uh, next year, the projected Mount Abe uh, assessment for FY22 is based on 34.07. And I put some historical numbers there, uh, just in for comparison. Um, at the fall of last year, we had 40 FTEs from Mount Abe, and in the spring we had 38. Uh, it's not unusual to find a small fluctuation from fall to spring, uh, but this this fall we only have 29 order uh, from Mount Abe. So you can see uh, part of the uh, impact is. Uh, on the drop in FTEs is related to the to the change in uh, schedule, and uh, that's uh, something that hopefully we'll be able to address as we uh, move forward for uh, next year and beyond. Um, we continue to work collaboratively with all sending schools, coordinate on proficiency attainment. We're moving forward with our uh, to offer the CP2 within the IB framework. Uh, that candidacy has actually been approved. At the time I did this, it was still pending, but it's now been approved. Uh, and as we discussed last year, uh, we'll be working uh, more closely with the Addison County superintendents to make sure that information such as this evening's uh, information gets out to uh, business managers and uh, superintendents so that they have a better idea of uh, what they can be uh, looking at last year uh, with a variety of uh, challenges and unknowns, uh, we had some uh, communication uh, lapses, I think, in terms of uh, what we were looking at. So we're happy to be uh, sharing this information with you earlier, um, and we'll be happy to come back and share more uh, specific information and certainly share that with the um, central office, with Patrick and his staff uh, as we move forward in the, with the budgeting process. And this is our first outreach meeting uh, for closer collaboration. So uh, at that point, I was told I had a, a very limited amount of time, but I've stayed within my time constraints, Patrick. So I'll open it up to any questions. Was I on mute? Heard you. No, we, we got it. <laughs> okay. Any questions? I, I didn't. Yes, Kristen. I know um, last year you said, um, Dana, that there was a big increase of Mount Abe students at yes. the Career Center. How is, how is that trend this year? <laughs> um, it was trending very positively, but the uh, the change in schedule had a, a significant impact on Mount Abe over uh, some of our other partner schools. So um, you could see in the uh, comparison figures that I gave you, 
uh, there was a drop in at least 11 FTEs that can translate into as many as 20 or 30. Actually, it's more than 20. It's, it's probably somewhere between 30 and 35 students uh, for the shoot. They're Specifically pre-tech, right? Primarily. Okay. Then. I, I can't say that it was exclusively pre-tech. Um, I did hear some uh, information. I haven't been able to review those, but it was um, uh, primarily. Uh, pre-tech because in fact I think we got no pretext students if, if I'm not mistaken uh, from Mount Amy that's that's the guy we had a full uh, full section for uh, Mount Amy students exclusively I think uh, at one point in time so um, that's just part of I think the COVID phenomenon if you want to follow that but we're hoping to re re reconnect and reestablish that uh, moving forward. Uh, what I will say is that our, our success countywide last year was due in large part to the fact that we were collaborating uh, as a, a county uh, leadership group to uh, provide uh, equitable access to all of our um, students, regardless of what their origin was, whether it was one of our partner high schools or whether it was uh, home study students um, or students from outside of uh, the county. Um, so I, I'm very pleased with the way our progress was heading and we just need to uh, resume that, I think, and make sure that we can all be on a similar uh, schedule to allow that equitable access. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. So uh, I, I didn't mention this, but we're looking at a, um, a tuition rate that is uh, decreasing by uh, an assessment rate that's decreasing by about 11% and a, um, an overall tuition cost decreasing by uh, 7%. And that's with no other changes. I mean, that's just, this is a very preliminary budget, but we think that we're, uh, those, the numbers that we have are, are pretty good that those are, are savings that we can, we identify in a preliminary fashion, uh, should be able to uh, carry through. And that has to do with uh, staffing shifts and costs and, and new, new staff coming on board and uh, uh, reduced costs. The, the outlier, and it's already built into this, is what our, um, rates are going to be for uh, health care. And so we've been told that they're going to try to keep it under 10 per, uh, 10 percent, under double digits, but we've used 10 percent as a placeholder. And that is also figured into uh, that uh, savings. So that would be an increase. And so there are other places where we are uh, pretty confident that there will be some uh, offsetting reductions. So we're happy about that. We haven't gotten into a lot of uh, nitty gritty and that will be happening at our next board meeting in a couple of weeks uh, and they'll be getting a presentation it's a little more uh, detailed than what you have here but we put this together in a manner to be able to present uh, to Mount A what we thought would be some of the important uh, pieces of information FTEs uh, where we are with serving students and what the uh, approximate uh, cost would be. So uh, for a preliminary budget, and this is much earlier than we've already done before, Patrick, I think you can take your your 20, um, your 34.07 FTEs and multiply it by, um, by 14,520, and you should be able to get a, a ballpark placeholder for um, the career center assessment for next year. Now, that's all subject, to, of course, to change by AOE and but it's going to be a much a better uh, reflection of where we are than we were able to give you uh, last year. Plus, we've had a change in our, our staffing, and that has been a very um, welcome uh, addition to our finance team. So uh, we feel much more well-placed to be able to provide more timely information. So we're hoping that one prove to be the case. Thank you. And as we talked about uh, in our countywide superintendents meeting, uh, the idea was to get started early. And uh, so I really appreciate Patrick reaching out to me in September. And I told him it would be much easier for us to have some kind of preliminary numbers by October. So thank you for making time on your board agenda, very packed board agenda, I'm sure. 
to um, uh, hear a few words from the Career Center. And we very much appreciate the uh, students and our collaboration with uh, faculty and staff at Bellingham. So uh, you are a very valued partner and I wanna just make sure that you uh, know that and uh, appreciate our um, work together. So thanks so much. Thank you, Dana. Awesome, thanks, Dana. You're welcome, take care. Uh, I'll sign off. And if anybody has any uh, needs or questions, feel free to reach out. We'll be happy to uh, send you information or uh, connect with you individually uh, via uh, Zoom or via Google Meet uh, for you to get uh, more information directly uh, from us if that would be beneficial. So we're available to help serve all of our partners. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks, Dana. Take care. Sure, I got. All right. So we're moving along now to accept the monitoring report for 1.1 core subjects in a digital and global environment, 1.2 life and career skills, 1.3 learning and innovation skills. And um, the monitoring worksheet was included if anybody needed to jot down a few notes. Um, I have yours, Kevin. Thank you. So is there a motion to accept the monitoring report? So moved, Sarah McLean. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Is there a second? I'll second, Andrew. Thank you. Okay, any discussion? I'm happy to kick off the discussion. We have a some guest speakers here tonight to elaborate a bit on the report that was submitted. And I'll, I'll kind of set the table and then I'll turn it over to Katrina and she can do some introductions and we'll go from there. Okay. Um, so as you as you likely saw in the report that was submitted, um, sort of reflecting on the conversation that I think took place at the retreat, the in recognition of the way last school year ended and the impact that had on more quantitative data that we might have usually produced. Uh, the board allowed some latitude for this ENDS monitoring report to be more of a strategic plan report. Um, and by nature, that makes it more of a means report than an ENDS report. So we, we kind of took that liberty and produced what you see here. And it was really hard to, to really speak about the work that was happening around the strategic plan without acknowledging the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic had on, on our system in every aspect of it, not exclusively the work that was happening on our, on our strategic plan. I would say for the first three quarters of last year, we were making tremendous progress um, in the implementation of our strategic plan. We had implementation teams that were very, very active. We had an oversight team that was considering the work that was underway last year and thinking about how that, that could springboard us into the work that would be taking place this school year. That oversight team was on the cusp of making a, a recommendation for what our focus and priority areas should be this school year. And then COVID came in March. And that really, <clears throat> As, as I mentioned in the report, that turned our world pretty upside down in every way, shape, and form. It changed what we teach, when we teach, how we teach, who we teach. Um, it changed how we feed students. It changed how students get to school, how they walk in the halls. It has changed every aspect of our organization. And despite those challenges, when we reflect back on how MAUSD responded from in, in literally in a matter of two or three days, standing up a childcare when most places were not able to, figuring out how to deliver meals to the homes of all of our students and completely revolutionizing the way instruction is delivered 
from the more traditional, all students are in school all the time to no students are in school physically anymore. And we have to deploy devices, et cetera, hard copy packets, whatever was needed, we deployed um, and did all of that literally in fewer days than you could count on one hand. Tremendous, tremendous efforts individually by a lot of individual people, but more importantly, I think efforts by teams of people in a very intentionally designed system of supports that we've spent some years building now that we were able to really lean very heavily on in that time of crisis. I'm pretty convinced had we not had those structures in place, we wouldn't have been able to pull off what we did pull off. So obviously our, our strategic plan progress came to a screeching halt for a period of time. And then it wasn't until really over this summer that some momentum started to build back around strategic plan work. And as we get into this fall, that, that pace in which we're refocusing on our strategic plan is increasing. And you're gonna hear a bit more from folks about where we got last year, a little bit about where we are now and about where we're going from here. Um, and then when, when we've heard a bit more of the details and, and we are gonna get into the weeds a bit and I'll acknowledge that it's really enticing. And I wanna let you know, we're gonna be swimming at the top of the weeds here tonight. There are depths of weeds that I caution you to go too far into because we may not be able to return from them. There, there are so many weeds and you're gonna hear folks as they elaborate, and I hope they do, you're gonna get a sense of the expertise that tonight's presenters bring to the table. They'll, they'll take you into the depths a little bit on a guided journey into the deep weeds, and then they'll safely return you to the surface of those weeds. Um, just to give you a sense of what, what work is happening, um, and how powerful that work is um, and the level of expertise within the organization. Uh, I'm sure you'll be as proud as I am of the work that's happening. So after that, I'll, I'll come back and I'll sort of summarize um, as I did in the report around compliance or non-compliance. And then we can take questions and, and maybe after the presentation, we should take some questions and I can do my piece after. I wanna respect the time that our presenters have here tonight. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Katrina. And Katrina, would you like me to invite some folks in as panelists now? That would be fantastic, thank you. Um, I couldn't possibly echo any more of what Patrick just said. I'm humbled and uh, respectful and so lucky to work with such incredible individuals on a very regular basis. Um, I'm about to introduce you, and I have the pleasure of introducing to you, members, key members of our instructional support team, most of whom have been instrumental in leading the strategic plan charge since the goals and priority objectives were finalized, as most of you recall, in the spring of 2019. So as folks are starting to come in, I will introduce. I think I have everyone, Shannon. Yeah, I see them. All right, Gabe Hamilton. Hi, Gabe. This is our proficiency-based learning coordinator and coach, 14th year in the district. I, I hope I have all these numbers right. Like I literally was going back and checking. Fifth year doing, uh, 13th, is it 13? <laughs> okay, 15, holy smokes. Whatever amount of years doing this work. First at Mount Abe specifically, he was helping lead the charge with um, a partner after getting a, a Rowland Fellow grant and working pretty heavily at Mount Abe. Many of you have seen um, Gabe present in the past alongside of Andrew Jones back in the day. Um, and now he's been working for the district um, in his um, efforts to increase proficiency-based learning at the pre-K-12 level. Um, Gabe has a background teaching uh, middle school science at Mount Abe, as well as other places, um, in addition to photography. Thank you for joining us, Gabe. Nice to see you there. Um, here. Thank you. Yeah. Sheena Strada, fourth year, right? 
Okay. As our literacy coordinator, um, she's been a literacy coach actually at the Career Center um, and a middle school language arts teacher in, in other districts. We're excited to have you, Sheena. Thanks for joining us as our literacy coordinator. Ray Donovan. Hi, Ray. This is Ray's second year with us as our social emotional learning coordinator. She is a special educator, has a background in special education, including in our neighboring district in Addison Central. She's been a program director, has taught middle school and high school. Thank you for joining us tonight, Ray. And then here's our new folk, Miss Kim Audette. Welcome. This is our new this year math coordinator. Um, Kim comes to us with a, a, a lengthy resume in mathematics instruction. She's been a math coach. She was actually the director of learning in another neighboring district in Addison Northwest for a time. She has taught at the middle school, high school, and uh, postgraduate level in college. So thank you so much for joining us, Kim. Talk about a, um, a, a quick getting to know a system during a pandemic. So thank you for joining our team and taking a risk being with us. We're excited to have you. So as Patrick said, we decided with your support back at the retreat to use um, this month as an opportunity to give you an update. And so these fine folks have put together some, um, some slides with some highlights. They are, they're gonna bring you back, they're gonna bring you to now, they, they, they're gonna bring you a little bit forward. We've structured our presentation to be about 15 minutes for each strategic plan goal area. So 15 minutes for expertise and learning. We'll stop there and take a few minutes for some questions and then 15 minutes for social emotional learning and there'll be questions there. Um, it's important that we let them get through their presentation as much as possible, but please jot down questions on your own because it, it, there's going to be a lot of information. And, and as Patrick said, things will start to make more sense and then it'll start to get a little confusing and then it's going to make more sense and it's going to get good. So we'll certainly do our best to help navigate information that we certainly want you to have, um, especially in the Q&A. All right, so I think our plan at this point, uh, Patrick, is to give Gabe the screen sharing rights and we'll get started with expertise and learning. Everybody see the, my screen here? All yep. right. Kim, you can go ahead and take it away. Great, thanks, Gabe. Um, so as Katrina mentioned, we've kind of divided the work this evening in terms of focusing on both the expertise and learning goal and on the social emotional goal. So we're gonna start off with the expertise and learning. Um, as you know, the strategic plan has two main objectives under this goal. Our goal is around um, the fact that all MAUSD students will achieve academic excellence in an innovative and flexible learning environment. And although we are addressing both objectives, we're really focusing on objective two, which is around giving all MA, MAUSD students expertise, um, ex excuse me, experience on a, in an aligned proficiency-based curriculum with varied assessments that measure and monitor their individual growth and outcomes. Uh, there's been a lot of work around the alignment of that proficiency-based curriculum. And each of our three grade spans really are at different stages of that work. And now we're gonna kind of dive in and describe a little bit of where each of those stages are. Before we dive too deep, I want to just kind of give a basic overview of kind of some of the fundamental principles or tenets of proficiency-based learning. Um, so one of the key pieces is that transferable skills have kind of been elevated um, and, and held in equal importance to that content knowledge and skills that we're used to in schools. So um, I'll talk more about what this looks like, but that's a really important piece of all of this. Another piece is that achievement is tied directly to very clearly articulated learning targets 
and the um, the results of that clear articulation or clear communication is that we really know where students are at. One other piece to that is separating out what are called work habits or habits of work. Um, and those are, you know, in other systems can be confused or conflated with other mechanisms of reporting. And by separating that out, we really get a clearer picture of where students are at. And then another element is that students have multiple opportunities to demonstrate proficiency. So really what we're talking about here is that time and support are variable and learning is constant. So our expertise in learning work is really rooted in the connections between the tenets of proficiency-based learning and the research and literature around professional learning communities known as PLCs. You see the citation at the bottom of our slide. Richard and Rebecca Dufour, who are renowned educational researchers and developers of the PLC, they used these four student-centered questions to guide the work of teams of professionals. PLCs are our system for organizing and implementing this work. Focusing on these four questions drives us to develop curriculum, instruction, and assessment that result in equitable outcomes for all MAUSD students. This particular slide, um, talking about getting into the weeds a little bit, is, is essentially, it's like a glossary slide. So there's a lot of information in this slide for sure, but ultimately what it does is it starts to, to, to make it so we can see the connections between things. So if we think about our proficiency-based graduation requirements, which our uh, graduating class last year, class of 2020, graduated based on these requirements, um, our uh, state adopted standards, so things like the Common Core, the C3 NGSS, set, NGSS for science are represented there. And then you can see that this kind of funnels down um, into smaller and smaller grain sizes until you get to learning targets and lesson targets, which is ultimately where the work with students is happening. Informative and summative evidence is being gathered and reported on. So Gabe just mentioned learning targets as part of that glossary slide. So in order to embody and model proficiency-based instruction and assessment for our faculty and staff, the expertise and learning team writes learning targets for each school year. You'll notice that the school year 20 learning targets here were written for all faculty and staff and then differentiated into specific targets for the elementary and middle high school levels. We did that to reflect the fact that their middle high school began the journey to a proficiency-based system years ago, while our elementary system was just beginning that work last year. For this school year, thank you, Gabe. Uh, we were able to craft one target for each level, elementary and middle high school, as we've zeroed in on the exact next steps for our organization. And these targets happen to be remarkably similar to each other, even though we did not write them together. And that reflects the alignment already of the work at the elementary and the secondary levels. Much of this work um, is, is possible because of the systems that have been put into place in our district. Uh, we have a very impressive uh, collaborative team that has thought through uh, key players in order to make sure that everybody in the community is accounted for as we move this work forward. There's a great deal of coordination that happens between the levels of those involved, including coordinators, coaches, and teacher leaders. Uh, I can give you a quick glance at a work distribution table. And by looking at this document, I don't expect you to be able to see the tiny grain size, but more importantly, I want you to be able to be able to visualize how every member of our community has been thought through in terms of their involvement in this work. So we've broken every single um, different subgroups of our 
faculty and staff so that they were accounted for into these productive work groups to then work to achieve the initiatives that are outlined within our strategic plan. Speaking of our work groups being productive, this slide contains a timeline of the first year of this expertise in learning work at the elementary level. Previously, I alluded to the growth from last year to this year. You'll see that we began school year 20 with what I like to call PBL 101, introducing our faculty and staff to the basic principles of proficiency-based learning and laying the foundation for the work ahead. We leaned heavily on our coordinators and instructional coaches to create systems for the development of work plans, facilitation of our PLCs, and ongoing coaching support for teachers. In November, we were writing learning targets. And by February, we were beginning to identify elements of proficiency-based instruction related to the learning targets that had been created. Even though the pandemic and the extended school dismissal brought incredible challenges, we were able to turn some of these challenges into positives. When the pandemic hit in March, we and our teams of coaches created curriculum plans that align teaching and learning across the district, allowing our elementary teachers to collaborate across schools in ways they had not previously, all facilitated by instructional coaches. Our teams were able to continue to create curriculum documents for our teachers to respond to, which informed our annual summer curriculum work. Held in June, our curriculum camps were a chance for teams of teachers to safely collaborate, to add to and produce curriculum documents that have set up the work for this year, which began with introducing the products of the summer work to the full elementary faculty during August pre-service. So the work for 712 continues as we make progress in refining our systems to answer those four to four questions. Last year, in addition, in addition to graduating our first class with proficiency-based graduation requirements, we've been able to increasingly prioritize and align our learning targets as well as better, under, better design assessments that consider the whole child. With clear criteria, we are also now able to calibrate our assessments to ensure our rigor, le rigor level is in line with internal and statewide assessments. Some of the highlights include increasing prioritization of learning targets, and again, that better aligned and calibrated assessment that really is meeting the needs of students with highlighting both their strengths and challenges and implemented through the lens of equity and universal design. Additionally, we were able to work in PLCs as advisory grade level teachers to build capacity for student ownership of this PLP process while increasing students and teachers understanding of transferable skills that I mentioned before through assessment, calibration and reflection. Some of the highlights in this work included regular advisory lessons that were directly tied to transferable skills course commitments to transferable skills that teachers kind of committed to for both teaching and assessing. And then culmination of that work really was highlighted in senior PLP reviews that despite COVID continued and each and every one of our seniors engaged in a PLP review where they spoke about and reflected on their path to toward proficiency of those transferable skills, as well as other highlights of their educational careers at Mount Abe. Part of that review process was also an opportunity to provide feedback. And through that feedback, as well as feedback from students, other students and faculty, we were able to convene in a, a summer curriculum camp with 16 different advisors to overhaul our PLP template to increase relevance for future students. Links to some of these things are included in this presentation, which I believe you have access to. If not, you will at the conclusion. So looking ahead, we know that the full transition to a proficiency-based system and the creation of any curriculum and comprehensive assessment system takes years. We feel good about where we are at this point, 
and we're excited about the curriculum instruction and assessment professional development we're we are preparing to provide MAUSD faculty and staff this year. We also know that the realities of COVID-19 mean that anything can happen and we're also prepared to shift our plans as appropriate to meet the changing needs of MAUSD. At this point, we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Sarah? Yeah, I have a question um, in regard to the slide that was speaking to the timeline for um, the elementary schools process. And I'm curious of what the feedback has been since, um, you know, since every, since we've arrived where we are now about the collaboration that took place in March with between different schools. And like you had said, there were designed forms that instructors and teachers could fill out. Um, and yeah, I'm curious of what the feedback has been from those teachers and how you've gathered that feedback. That is a great question. Um, so we put out we use Google Forms to create feedback mechanisms for teachers to provide us information on a regular basis. We also have a good amount of anecdotal information that was shared with us, either shared during in conversation, via email. Um, the vast majority of the feedback that we have received around what we did during remote learning from March to the end of the school year was very positive. Um, our teachers loved the ability to collaborate across schools and have explicitly asked for the ability to continue to do that. Um, and while it was new for us to provide curriculum documents in the way that we did, I think that they were well received given the circumstances. Should we go fully remote this year, I think we'll structure things a little bit differently, but given the absolute panic and the fact that we had two days to build a curriculum that would last us the next eight, 12 weeks. Um, I think there was a general sense of deep gratitude that there was something that people could implement and they could do it together because not only were we implementing a curriculum remotely, we were doing it remotely. So we were learning the tech tools and the skills to, to teach in that different virtual environment together collaboratively. Other questions? I feel like I saw at least one more hand. Krista. I can't hear you, Krista. While well, she's doing that, I would just like to say it's uh, exciting to hear you're getting uh, senior PLP sort of feedback. That's uh, that's an exciting and direct kind of uh, source of understanding whether we're meeting our ends or not. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So strange. Um, I, I think maybe Floyd made a comment that I was going to make. I have a question, but my comment was that it's great to hear that there's a feedback loop with faculty um, because that sounds like the system is coming, is a 360 process, which is really important. Um, I guess my question might also apply to the next presentation as well, and, and maybe it's too big to be answered right now, but I know later on in our agenda, we're going to be talking about the budget, and I guess I'm just wondering, you know, and as we plan for our district moving forward, um, what you see is the limits on your work currently. In other words, if you had all the resources in the world to build this, do you have them right now? Or do you feel hamstrung in any way? Um, because I think we want to know if we're able to support what we've set out to do, and if not, what's missing. So again, it may not be an easy a question to answer off the cuff or right now, but I would love for us to be thinking about that. You remind me that I think part of my little job here was to talk about the difference between clarifying and probing questions. Krista, that's a probing question 100%, but one that keeps us up daily 
thinking about, I, I, I think I speak for folks in our organization, especially those who are new to our organization, when we say that we feel very fortunate, not only do we have amazing people, um, but we have pretty strong structures. Um, and I think we all kind of see or hear the ticking of, you know, COVID, of facilities, you know, all the ticking of budget, all of that. So I think we try to capitalize as, as quickly, as frugally, as efficiently, and as humanely as we possibly can to do as much as we can in the, what will never be enough time in this job. <laughs> so I, I, it is a probing question, one that we can't answer simply, but I hope those couple of points help kind of put in context for you that we're always thinking about being fortunate and happy with what we have, using things efficiently, frugally, effectively, and always knowing that we need to be ready to switch up our plan if we need to. Sarah. Uh, yeah, to Steve's uh, mention of the senior PLP feedback, which I agree is, is, a, is a great source to have, um, you know, for on the ground um, evidence. And I'm wondering, I don't see that, that any, that's mentioned as a source of evidence um, in, in the report. And I'm wondering, will we use, will we use the senior PLP feedback or is that the senior surveys? that were mentioned. I can, I can start a little bit. We, we did talk about is that data that we would want to include for you um, because it was a pilot. It was the first time it was used. We decided against it for right now that it's a document that's being used internally. Um, but I know Gabe, you're, you'd be very interested in sharing that kind of data in the future. Please add if you like. Yeah, I, I can't uh, speak enough about the the quality of the information and the 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 really the depth of the reflection that we were able to get from doing those uh, PLP reviews. So there's certainly a wealth of information that we can utilize and are utilizing in a variety of different ways to really think about our systems and how we can. Um, support students and and help them achieve their ends and their and their hopes and dreams beyond uh, Mount Abe. Um, so, as a parent who um, has a student who graduated pre this kind of stuff, um, and speaking for parents that I talk to all the time. Every year, could you guys provide, and I know this is old school, the chart, because I know I saw it somewhere and I can't find it, that has the equivalent of the numbers now to grades previously, because I think that's how parents think to figure out how their kid is doing in a class. And it's hard um, without having, there was there's a chart somewhere. So just saying that um, that just helps parents to look at the number and know how their kid's doing and if they need to remediate their child in some sort of way or try to. So that's just a parent feedback um, as we're in this transition, maybe in five years, it won't be necessary, but it's, you know, what are the equivalents that we're seeing when we see a 3.2 or 3.6 or 2.8? It's still a little bit vague, I think for parents. So anyway, but I, I, I think it's certainly going in the right direction uh, for the kids. I'll respond. I think it's a, I'm not sure it says direct a correlation between the numbers and the grades. I think they, they say something different. And I think part of the unpacking in a proficiency based system is the recognition that parents always thought they knew what letter grades meant, but the reality is it meant something different for each teacher. Um, and I think that's part of the education that we're still working on is, you know, when, it, when a kid got a B in English back in the day, it could be because they really knew their stuff and performed well in assessments, but their work habits weren't great. And the average of the two created a B. 
could be the exact opposite. Maybe they didn't really perform well. They didn't really know their stuff that well, but they worked really hard. And so their work habits artificially elevated their score to a B. And so two kids could get a B in their English class and have those polar opposite realities. And parents thought, okay, B, either I'm okay with a B or I'm not okay with a B. But they didn't necessarily know what it meant. In this proficiency-based system, there's great effort to separate the two. We're gonna report out what you know and can do relative to what the expectations are. Separate from that, what are your work habits? And are you, are you participating in class? Are you doing the work that's expected, et cetera? Are you on time? Um, and so it's not, it's not as easy to have those directly correlate to what letter grades used to be. That's sort of a, a high level response to that. And that's part of the education that is certainly ongoing, has been ongoing for a while, but, but re there remains a lot of work to do there. I'm not familiar with the chart you're referring to. Maybe others could speak to that, but that's, that's sort of where my mind goes in response to that question. Yeah, I think I would echo what, what Patrick um, said in, in we, that, that chart existed uh, in our early phases of, translation, um, but we have intentionally um, don't make that chart public for, for just exactly the reasons that Patrick uh, alluded to in his response. So it, it is it is complicated and um, I think that it uh, it requires a lot of education in and of itself and, and we have to do a better job of, of just communicating exactly what those numbers do mean. Um, so I appreciate the, the question. And, and I'll try to give it one more specific example because I, I waxed philosophic a bit there for a minute ago. In the old system, if a teacher was asking, if a teacher gave an assessment that had 10 questions and those questions were all um, what the student was expected to do for their grade level performance, and the student got all 10 of those right, they would get a 100% and that would translate to an A or maybe an A plus if, they, if somebody liked pluses. Um, in the current proficiency-based system, if an assessment asks a student only questions that they're expected to know and they get them all right, that's a three. They're demonstrating knowledge that's expected of them. They meet the standard. In order for it to be a four, they would go, have to demonstrate exceeding the standard. Um, and so that's where like a four doesn't correlate to an A necessarily. Uh, and a three isn't a B, like it doesn't quite work that way. And that's an example as to why it doesn't quite work that way. Right, and the thing that makes parents nervous is the college bound student still. And I don't know, I, I, I haven't experienced a kid going to college yet on this system, but again, that's where I hear a lot of like, you know, um, anxiety. So I don't need to talk about it more here, but that does exist. And um, you know, what percentage of the world is using the system? Do colleges truly understand it? And um, but I, that's but you, no one needs to answer my question. But that's just my question that I can get answered later. So thank you. Thank you, Kristen. I'm I'm conscious of time. Are we ready to move into the social emotional learning component? All right. Awesome. We're gonna share the screen with Ray now. Thank you, EIL team. Not that all of this isn't intertwined, it is, so don't leave. Um, but thank you so much for your presentation and we'll turn it over to Ray Donovan. Hi everybody, I am Ray Donovan. I'm going to share my screen. All right, so tonight I'm going to be talking about social and emotional learning here at Mount Abe. The SEL goal from the strategic plan is that all MAUSD students will develop their social, emotional, and physical well being. The objective number one is the one that MAUSD decided to focus on last year and that we are continuing to focus on this year. And that states that all MAUSD students apply the knowledge, attitudes, and skills necessary to manage emotions, show empathy, maintain positive relationships, 
make responsible decisions and achieve their goals. So I'm gonna begin by talking about why SEL briefly. Um, there is more and more research every day about social and emotional learning. It is um, sweeping the nation, let's say. So I'm gonna say just a few of the benefits that research, research has shown us about SEL in schools. A few of them are that there are more positive attitudes towards oneself, others, and tasks, decreased emotional distress, conduct problems, and risk-taking, improved test scores, grades, and attendance, and engaged citizenship. I'm going to talk about SEL using a framework of the how and the what. So there are two pretty distinct ways that we are moving forward at MAUSD in terms of SEL. One is how do we teach and support students, the structures and the systems that are in place, and the other is the what. What SEL skills do we want students to have? So here's a sentence, it's the same sentence twice. The first part of this sentence relates to the how, which is that social and emotional learning provides a foundation for safe and positive learning. And the second part of the sentence talks about the what, which is that SEL enhances students' abilities to succeed in school, careers, and life. So I'm gonna talk about the how. So once again, that first part of the sentence, how do we provide a foundation for safe and positive learning at MEUSD? In the classroom, we do this through Responsive Classroom, which is a framework that leads to joyful, caring, and respectful communities. We have created universal practices and strategies which are used intentionally for student support at the universal and at the targeted level. Um, that is based on best thinking from PBIS, Brandy Simonson, and many other thinkers, um, as well as through the lens of what does MAUSD care about? What do our teachers care about? And in what direction are we going? We are providing professional learning opportunities this year through a consistent framework of mixed district groupings. These SEL work groups um, for teachers during in-service are um, opportunities for our faculty and staff, including EAs and um, BAs, to be able to learn more about these universal practices and strategies. School-wide, we have positive behavior intervention and supports um, at all levels. By the end of this year, we will be um, at all levels, universal targeted and intensive levels at all schools um, in really active uh, per participation at all levels. District-wide, we last year met with all faculty and staff to talk about the foundational norms of feedback and reflection. These really tie into our coaching model and also um, we just had a, a real focus last year on how being open to feedback and what that means and also reflecting on our practice are really um, important as we grow. We also provided trauma-informed practices and strategies training for every school. This year, we had training on restorative practices. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about dyad partnerships. It's something I'm really excited that we have in our district, um, but that's something else that we have district-wide committed to. And we also have a multi-tiered system of support, an MTSS system at MAUSD. So pr prior to the strategic plan, MAUSD was really already working on objective three. So these are the three objectives under our SEL goal. And I just wanted to highlight the fact that PBIS is very connected to the how of SEL instruction. How do we have a safe learning environment that is positive and engaging, student-centered? Um, and so objective three is that all MAUSD students experience a sense of value and belonging in their schools. And through reinforcement systems and school-wide celebrations, um, student-created expectations, that, those are many of the foundational um, underpinnings of PBIS. And so we really are working on both objective one and objective three. These are the ups, as we're calling them, the universal practices and strategies. So I'm just gonna be quiet for a few seconds and give you an opportunity to look at these best practices um, for our classrooms. So this document is more fully fleshed out um, in its totality, but this is sort of some of the guide, the guiding principles of best classroom practice. 
So just a timeline of what the how, how do we create these safe and engaging learning environments for students um, to be able to learn and grow and feel supported. Well, before 2019, PBIS was adopted and responsive classroom the framework was used in our elementary schools. Last year at a classroom level, um, we created the universal practices and strategies guide. And we also provided the trauma informed training we had training in dyads and feedbacks. And at the district level, we shared our MTSS system and continued implementation of PBIS uh, through multiple trainings in multiple schools and as well as coaching. New this year is that we are anchoring our MTSS support plan. So if there's a student concern, um, teachers are able to really think through their universal practices and strategies and how to help support students. And we also have created an aligned self-reflection tool as well as a walkthrough tool that we'll be sharing with school leadership this year, um, which is also aligned to the universal practices and strategies that teachers are um, engaging with. We're strengthening our MTSS at all levels, which also creates opportunities for ongoing embedded professional learning through coaching. And Again, PBIS has been implemented by the end of this year, will be implemented at all levels at all school, um, including monthly PBIS meetings and data sharing. And the PBIS is, uh, we're constantly aligning it with our MTSS system. So now I'm gonna move to the what. So what are the skills that we want students to know? Um, you know, I, I talk about this a lot and we think about, well, we know what we want a third grader to be able to do in math. You know, that's something that at EIL was just talking about. But one of the things that Gabe mentioned was that transferable skills, which is um, the way that we have been framing some of our thinking around social and emotional learning up till this point at Mount Abe. Um, is really elevated so that it is um, the same importance as content. And so we're really thinking about these SEL proficiencies in the same way as we think about EIL proficiencies. So in the classroom, this looks like direct and aligned SEL instruction and curriculum. Our kindergarten through sixth graders all have access to second step zones of regulation and Kelso's choice throughout the district. This year, our middle school is piloting second step and we also explicitly are teaching SEL skills um, and connecting them to equity. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a moment. School-wide, we are expanding our inventory of targeted SEL skill instruction and strategies. So we're really looking, um, you know, when we, up till this point, we didn't always define skills. And so instead we had a deficiency model and um, not a strengths-based model. So we would just see misbehavior and we would, um, you know, kind of retroactively be uh, reactive to problems instead of actively teaching skills. And so now using data, we're able to see where students may need support in building skills and we're able to target that support um, now that we are moving in the direction of really knowing what kind of skills we are hoping for our students to have by the time they graduate from um, MAUSD. So district-wide, sorry about that. District-wide, um, we are using our SEL proficiencies for students and adults in a couple different ways. Um, and for our adults, we are connecting these proficiencies to equity circles. So every time we have in-service and these SEL work groups, we are um, having equity circles. And that's why our groups of staff are the same every time so that they can get comfortable with one another and really have some of these important conversations with one another as they connect these proficiencies to um, different concepts that are important when we are addressing our own biases or um, trying to move to greater equity. So this is the objective one, which I already read, but I just wanted to show you that what I read up front really is what the what is of the SEL work, the SEL skills. These are the skills that we want students to have. And this is based on CASEL, which is the Collaborative for Academic, Social and Emotional Learning, which is a foundational institution. It's been around for 25 years and has really been guiding SEL work throughout our country, many different um, districts and states are moving in this direction and almost all of them are using CASEL as a guide for district-wide implementation. 
So here we have that um, pre-2019 to 2020 guidance counselors at the K through six level did teach social and emotional learning skills through guidance classes. And the seventh through 12th grade level transferable skills were developed. Last year, counselors um, were really beginning to meet more often in order to align their, um, their lessons and you know, move towards consistency so that students had the same access to information and language when they transferred to Mount Abe. At the 7 through 12 level, the personalized learning plans, um, which Gabe was just talking about, were expanded upon. And we began exploring SEL curriculum that could be used at the middle and high school level. For K through 12, MAUSD was creating um, transferable skills and SEL, looking to the transferable skills to create the SEL proficiencies. So I think we had almost 30 hours or so of all the SEL, all the SEL team and all the MAUSD counselors meeting to um, create drafts of these proficiencies based on guidance from many, many states, um, really dozens of resources that we poured through to find the best thinking. We also used a DESA screener, which is a strengths-based screener that finds um, internalized behaviors that students are um, maybe having internalized ex emotional experiences. However, we decided to pause that this year um, just because it's a teacher-led screener and we weren't sure uh, based on a lot of uncertainties whether teachers were gonna have enough time um, to get to know their students consistently especially at the seventh through 12th grade level, but really, you know, we, we just had a lot of uncertainty and weren't sure that would be the best screener for us. Um, but it was useful last year and we may continue to use it in the future. We also used our SEL proficiencies that we had created with the counselors with, um, in curriculum camps with both elementary school and middle school teachers in June. This year, because we know how important it is that we are checking in on the well-being of our students because of the uniquely challenging aspects um, of this year. For the K through six grade, we have a weekly assessment screener, which students complete. It's a super kid-friendly um, way for students to um, have conversations, begin conversations with their teachers, and also use strategies. It's really not just a screener. It also teaches some really great strategies to kids. Um, to help them manage their emotions. And we are continuing to align curriculum. Counselors are continuing to meet and do that work as well as the SEL team. We, as I said, are piloting second step at the middle school. At the seventh through 12th grade level, there is a weekly well-being check-in as well, so that we are also giving students an opportunity to say how they are feeling, how they are doing, and then we have a response system in place for the counselors to check in on any students who may need extra support. Um, and then at the K through 12 level, we are using these SEL proficiencies in our ongoing in-service work. We also have a broader range of curriculum-based targeted supports and we're continuing to build that over the course of this year. And as I said, DESA is paused for this year. So just to talk a little bit about how did we build these SEL um, proficiencies, these are the five CASEL competencies um, that are in the orange, yellow, and green on the left. And on the right, you can see our MAUSD transferable skills that have been in practice in different ways and in development at Mount Abe for a while. And you can see that we created um, some alignment. There already was a lot of alignment between these CASEL competencies and transferable, the transferable skills. Um, and then we continued to do research and we continued to look at uh, many other states thinking and the draft that we are currently using are these four MAUSD SEL proficiencies. And as you can see, the language is um, scaffolded. So for self-awareness, that's a great word for ninth graders. And I am is a great word for kindergartners. Um, Knowledgeable is a great word for fifth graders. So we're really lucky to be able to think through a pre-K through 12 lens in creating these. This is a sample. So you can see that this, if you've seen the proficiencies that are in use um, for expertise and learning for content areas, we are aligning our work with them. So this is, um, this looks really similar, but instead of it saying a student should be able to, you know, divide whole numbers, it says um, that children can identify six basic emotions and love. And we are really trying to make these because it is so new for so many teachers as user-friendly as possible. So we will have strategies and sample activities at every level. And we're continuing to work on these this year. 
I just wanted to point again to the fact that SEL is not just an opportunity for our own self-growth, but is very connected to anti-oppression work and is a real lever for equity. And Castle has done a lot of that thinking as well. So we have um, been sharing information with the Mount Ave Equity and Diversity Committee and will continue to do so. Um, and our, our work has kind of been magically aligned with what we're doing with adult competency around this, um, with what they're sharing with students, um, because really it's a natural fit, equity and SEL. So how will we use these? I've sort of spoken to this, but at the universal level, we really want to have consistent and scaffolded language. We want to be able to embed these proficiencies in existing units of studies. And also as we move towards PLPs at all grade levels, um, we will be thinking through the lens of these proficiencies. Also for students who might need some more support, we have WinBlocks, How Labs, and FitBlocks as opportunities for targeted instruction using these proficiencies as a guide now that we really know and can name the skills that we want students to have. And at the intensive level, this also helps us fine tune intensive plans and really assess progress. Um, similar to what EIL shared, this is what our professional learning has looked like. We have ongoing PBIS learning. Um, in August, we offered 15 different SEL aligned workshops, which teachers got to choose from and um, all staff got to choose from. In October 2019, we really reintroduced what is SEL, why SEL to all teachers, because once again, um, there are some teachers that this is relatively new to and others that feel really confident and comfortable with this work. But we really wanted to make sure to calibrate that all um, the entire district was getting the same information at least once. In November, again, we did an interactive um, presentation in smaller groups for the district around feedback and reflection. Um, December through June, we had trauma-informed strategies, we had um, curriculum workshops, and again, worked on our proficiencies. This August, uh, we had executive skill um, development as a focus, as well as restorative practices, and got great feedback just to um, listen to one of the questions that came before, after every single opportunity uh, for professional learning of any size or any type. We request feedback and discuss it as a team and use it to inform our future work and take it really seriously and offer both um, quantitative and qualitative opportunities for feedback because we are um, both, we, we need it, we want it so that we can continue to grow and create the best opportunities that we can for learning. And also um, we wanna model how important it is to be consistently asking for feedback as a form of growth since for our students and teachers, that's such an important skill um, in itself. So this year, again, we have SEL work groups and um, we are using that consistent opportunity for folks to get to know each other well and do both independent work and have group conversations as well as have circles where, where they discuss um, equity and use the self-assessment of the universal practices and strategies. So they're getting to really fully explore the practices and strategies, self-assess where they think they're at in a way that's very safe and um, non-judgmental. It's their own work. And then if we end up using some of this for a walkthrough tool or for leadership um, to be able to be instructional leaders in their building, this will be something that teachers already have had a lot of learning around and a lot of their own time to reflect upon. And the last thing, well, my last slide that I'm going to talk about is these dyad partnerships. So dyads are um, an, a, an opportunity for connection and reflection at MAUSD. MAUSD believes that dyads, which are a protocol per, for providing and receiving sincere and concentrated attention, they are also called constructivist listening. It's based on constructivist learning um, from John Dewey, that this is a container, a format, a way of listening that will both strengthen our community connections and create opportunities to reflect on our thoughts and emotions. And here are some of the guidelines for constructivist listening. So throughout the district, every um, faculty or staff has a dyad partner and are meeting with their dyad partner. And every week I send out a feedback form about that. And we have a sort of positive reinforcement system where we celebrate folks who are able to make the time for their emotions it is very normal and natural for emotions to arise. And as we begin to do that work with our students, we really have to 
um, foundationally feel comfortable with ourselves and our own natural normal emotions that rise in the practice, arise in the practice of teaching, um, having relationships with so many people. It's incredibly normal that we have lots of feelings and thoughts. And also in a profession like teaching where you're constantly learning and growing, it's important that we have an opportunity to reflect in a safe space with a colleague on our professional and personal experiences and practice. So um, I'm thrilled that MAUSD has created this structure, adopted the structure. We started at the beginning of last year, um, but this is the first year that we have actually dyad partnerships. So thank you so much. I appreciate your time. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And I'm available for any questions. Dave. So um, how, how is this uh, used or dealt with uh, students who are remote? Um, the K, K through six students who are full-time remote. So PBIS um, is last year when folks, when, when everyone was remote, as well as this year in the virtual elementary school, um, PBIS is in practice. So our PBIS coach has been working with the teachers to maintain the same structure of PBIS um, in, ter in terms of sort of celebrating success in classes, expectations, positivity, relation based, relationship based learning. Um, so that's been one of the um, ways that that is continuing. And last year, when we were all remote, we were able to use the competencies that we developed for SEL skill based learning. Um, we aren't currently doing that with the uh, elementary school, but if we continue to have this elementary school, then it's something that we are considering and talking about. But it was wonderful. It was a wonderful opportunity last year to provide strategies and activities based on the SEL proficiencies for our students and families. Right. So just to add to that, uh, Ray's exactly right. Our PBIS coach, uh, one of them, Bill Huggett, has been working with our virtual elementary school teachers. And in fact, our 5-6 cohort just earned their first celebration. So tomorrow they're going to be brainstorming what it is they would like to do. And it's really um, sparked a great conversation with the remote learning teachers about uh, coming to some um, consensus about how we would like to potentially do a school-wide celebration, which I'm so excited about. I think that would be a lot of fun to celebrate together as an entire school remote community. Um, and just to add to that, the when we were full remote as an entire district, the um, some of the unified arts teachers um, came together in a couple of our schools and came up with something entitled uh, the acronym GLAMP, G-L-A-M-P, Guidance Library Art Music PE. And they collaborated around a particular skill, for example, self-esteem, resiliency, and they designed um, activities that were optional for kids to participate in around that theme, but through the lens of safe activity or an art activity. So we adopted their idea um, and actually they gave us some of their content from the beginning of this year when we were hybrid and we're just moving through some of those activities currently. Um, one of our remote learning teachers, Rachel O'Sullivan from Moncton, has taken the lead on uh, keeping a lot of those connections going for the kids in virtual elementary school. So thanks to the SEL team and thanks to uh, folks around the district who are willing to give us some fresh content for that, that work. Sarah McLean. Yeah, Ray, I just want to thank you for that presentation. It was, it was really interesting to uh, try to digest all that information. I'd love to, to, to see that presentation again or have it sent to me so I can read through it again, but I really appreciate all that information. And I just wanna say that as a parent, the focus on SEL as the kids have been coming back to school has been much appreciated. And um, I know at the Lincoln School, it's been, it's been a sincere focus and, um, and it's really kind of helped everybody transition into this new school environment. So I'm grateful for that, thank you. I just want to say that when Jennifer sent the updated agenda to all of you that included the hyperlink to tonight's um, information in Patrick's um, letter or summary, there are links to these presentations already. So you do have access to them. Chris. 
Krista. I really appreciate the presentation as well, Ray. And I was really interested to see the connections between SEL and the equity lens. Important and can't really be separated out. Um, and I was thinking about um, the ways that you're checking in with students regularly and getting feedback on how they're doing and, and thinking about my teenagers who are maybe less likely to share at any given moment what's really going on for them. And I was just wondering if there's any thought to doing any sort of school climate surveys or, you know, I know there's the youth risk behavior survey, but sort of like, how do you feel at Mount Abe? What's the, what's the vibe like? What's the environment like? Do you feel respected, appreciated, you know, to get a real sense of for that, for that group of kids, um, what their day-to-day -day life is like at Mount Abe and how that relates to their social and emotional well-being? We do have a plan to do one, and we did um, go to community council last year with that in mind. So, right, it was actually in like February, I think. So it, the timing wasn't um, didn't end up working out uh, for the survey, but it was approved as a proposal by community council. So it is something we will definitely do this year. And really, we are looking at a we're. We have the one we developed last year, and then we're also thinking through the fresh lens of COVID and what kinds of questions do we want to ask. And we have a couple different um, resources and references that we are working on. But yes, we are doing that. And there are, just to speak to, you know, the ways right now, every advisory has a, an opportunity to do a circle. It's kind of that, um, that groundwork for any kind of restorative practice it has to be some of that teaching. And so that's why we did that as a whole district this year. And Mount Abe has already been engaged in that. Um, and our MTSS coach continues to support that work, making, you know, kind of following up with it and creating circle prompts. Right now, some of that time is used, which is amazing for the equity and um, Black Lives Matter flag raising education opportunity. Um, but there is an SEL lens to all of that as well, like I was saying. Um, and then there is this survey that goes out once a week that is based on the proficiency, just a, well, a quick well-being check, because we, we were trying to find that balance of making sure that a student that maybe wasn't comfortable talking in a circle would at least feel like they could maybe, you know, just in the comfort of their own computer, have an opportunity once a week to have to say, how am I feeling? And um, that their advisor would be checking on that. So. Um, but yes, we will be doing a Mount a sort of cult, culture climate survey, as well as um, thinking through the well-being lens that is really important this year. Liz, did Thank you have your hand up? Okay, I think I think you gave it thumbs up. And Not seeing any more hands. Patrick? Thank you. Yeah, so again, I just want to thank the, the coordinators for their presentation tonight, but more importantly, for the work they're doing that they presented about tonight. I think you, you got a sense, and, and honestly, despite the depth of what you heard and saw in the slides, this is the surface of the work that's happening that they're, they're essential in helping to to make happen um, through the coordinators and and the coaches that's how it happens in the classrooms right this doesn't just um, materialize magically in classrooms without structures and support to to make that happen um, and it's it's truly remarkable work that's happening and i have no doubt that it will and is beginning to change outcomes for kids. The reality is for those outcomes to be demonstrated through the various data points that we typically collect that we weren't able to last year, it takes years of this sustained effort to really begin to see the kinds of shifts in student outcomes that we want to see. So historically, when I, when I report on the ENDS monitoring report, um, it's reflecting on student outcomes. In the past, I have reported non-compliance because I don't think our student outcomes have been what we could say we're satisfied with. 
we don't have the same kind of um, quantitative data that we would typically have. I suspect if we did, it might look slightly different than what we've seen in the past if we didn't have the pandemic interrupt everything, but likely not dramatically different because we're still early in the work that was just described. So I, I likely would report non-compliance again if that were what this report were focused on. I'm thankful that we had the opportunity this year in light of the COVID pandemic to do more of a means report or, or a strategic plan report because you got a depth of the work that I think is important for you to know. And because this report was really more about means and reflective of the work that the, that the adults in our system are doing to improve outcomes for kids, I can confidently report compliance because I think as you heard, again, just the, the surface level of tonight, this is the right work. Uh, it's not easy work. It takes a, a long time. It takes sustained effort. It takes systems of support, but it's the right work. And, and as we've all experienced in our lives, the right work is never the easy, quick work. And I think that's, that's as true in this scenario as it is in any other scenario. Um, so on this means report, I happily and proudly report compliance. Thank you. Thank you all for, for, for taking the time to give us, you know, a peek into what, what's happening a little deeper than we usually get to look. Steve? But we've already made a motion, correct? To accept? Right. right. <clears throat> so we're just discussing. Right. I have one tiny, tiny um, grain to throw um, and that's just to clean up the beginning of the monitoring report or remove some of the ANESU references. I think there, there's just a couple of them in the beginning. That's the only thing I really noticed. But thank you, it was a great report. Any more questions or comments? Kevin. I, I would um, like to hear a little discussion about uh, of my assumption, maybe it's not going to be true, but my assumption with all the upheaval of last spring and continuing into the fall, um, how that's affecting students and what if any sort of recovery is recognized as being needed um, to support them to potentially get them on back on track, if you will. Um, the, the other thing, I just wanna make the comment and Patrick did mention it about um, the hard data, but um, we can't lose sight of the fact that um, as unpopular as they are, at least at this school district, uh, maybe other ones that the um, test data that ends up on every, um, internet site you can imagine for whatever reason that we're compared with is is still out there and still real and even with the innovative systems that we're looking at migrating to um, it helps the student undoubtedly um, but does it help that community perception not not in our community but our surrounding communities I guess in response to the first question, there is no question in my mind that this COVID pandemic and, and what the spring needed to be in terms of remote learning, what the fall was, it still is at the secondary level in terms of a hybrid model. There are some exceptions to this, but by and large, this is damaging to student outcomes. It's damaging to students from a social and emotional frame for sure and it's for sure damaging from an academic perspective. The follow-up to that was, so in what, basically what are we gonna do about that? How do, we, how do we help students recover from that? The answer is 
the same way we've helped students recover within our system of supports, even pre-pandemic, right? We had students struggling pre-pandemic and we have a really robust system of supports that, that really supports students at all levels. It supports students at the core instruction level or tier one, which is through coaches helping teachers implement best practices. That's sort of a proactive preventative measure to ensure that that core instruction is as strong as it can be to help minimize the impacts um, felt from COVID, but also to help prevent students needing additional time and support to meet the standards. Then we have, uh, you heard in one of the presentations, the use of wind time, that's it's what I need. Uh, that's the term that's used at the elementary level, at the secondary level. Um, there are how labs and there are, um, help me with the term. Um, fit block, fit flexible block. instruction time. Flexible instruction time. That they're, they're sort of the equivalent to the win at the elementary level. The idea being that students who need a little more time and a little more support, that's built into the schedule. So they are whether it's a classroom teacher working a little differently with students to provide that, that additional time and support. Um, you know, the structures are a little different, but that's that next level of support that students may need if they're struggling. And then lastly, students that need more intensive support because the, the data suggests that their needs are greater than what can be met from a combination of tier one core instruction and tier two targeted instruction receive both tier one and tier two instruction and intensive intervention. That's where our, our move recently to increase the number of licensed professional interventionists to work with students comes into play. And of course, our special educators that we've had in place for a long time. So that system of supports through each of those three tiers really is what we lean on and is what ends up working over time when we have something like this global pandemic that exacerbates needs um, within the system. And we have processes through the, the EST process, that's our educational support team, um, where we're looking at student data, we're looking at various screenings that tell us which students are not where we'd want them to be. We then use that data to make some decisions about what interventions are needed. And we have people that are specially trained to work with students to meet those meet those needs based on that data. And then we monitor their progress really carefully uh, to make sure that the interventions that we have in place are making a difference in moving, moving students um, in the direction we need to see them moving. So sort of a long-winded way to say we help them the same way we've been helping students with these systems that we've put in place. And I think your point about the data is a really good point. Um, we, we have historically wanted to dismiss in some regard data like the kneecap or the SBAC that we've had um, in part because it doesn't tell us what we want to hear. We haven't historically had great data on those data points, um, which, which makes it desirable to sometimes dismiss. I bet if they were the best in the state, we wouldn't be dismissive of them. Having said that, they're not the be all end all, but they're part of our story and they're an important part of our story. And that information is data, it's a data point that's useful in combination with a lot of other data points. So I agree, we have to take those seriously. They are real, they are given a lot of weight um, and we use them in conjunction with others. I don't know, I think I hit on all your points, Kevin. Let me know if I missed something. Krista? I think that this, I, I wonder if this is a time where, uh, you know, since nobody's data, nobody has robust data on standardized tests anywhere this, from last year, probably for this year. And so, you know, and, and, and I'm probably in the camp of folks that think it's maybe not the best indicator of student growth, um, that it's maybe not the whole story and, and maybe not the best story. And so I wonder if we can use this time to better share um, all of the things we're doing to support students to continue to grow um, and to really tell that story really well. And I think in doing that, it maybe helps put less prominence on these standardized tests that 
you know, our one size fits all or one size may not fit many. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking about the community engagement piece and about how great it is to hear all of this rich information about the work that's being done in our schools and how I'd love for this to be shared out with more people. Um, and I think in, in doing that and in really being able to demonstrate all of the supports in place for students during this time, uh, you know, it, it, it can only be helpful to us and um, show that our outcomes are more than just um, kneecap scores. Okay. All right. Seeing anybody else with hands up. So thank you again, everyone, for your work and in presenting tonight. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so uh, we had a motion to accept the monitoring report for 1.1 course subjects in the digital and global environment. 1.2 life and career skills and 1.3 learning and innovation skills. All those in favor of accepting the monitoring reports, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. That pass. I just want to note everybody, it's now 8:11, so we're a little past our time. If if everybody could commit to nine o'clock and we will do our best to get through the rest of it and stop at nine. Is that acceptable? Okay. All right. So we'll keep going. The next item on our list is to uh, update. Uh, the financial report was in your packet. Are there any questions regarding that report? Floyd, thanks for the cheat sheet. All right, not seeing anything. We're gonna keep moving along. Next is a discussion uh, around budget projections. Patrick, do you wanna start us out with this discussion? Yeah, I have a presentation that I'll walk through really briefly. Um, it's information you've heard for the most part with some updated figures in light of the hold harmless, et cetera. The intent of this is to give you some context. Again, this is all really preliminary. We're in, we're in October still. We haven't really received any information from the state. But I think in terms of you, you have an agenda item later to set a budget target. And that's historically what we do in October. And I think it's important for me to give you whatever context I can with information that we have to help you make an informed decision about what that target should be. So I'll share my screen and um, I'll walk through that presentation really quickly, answer any questions, and hopefully that gives you what you need to have an informed conversation when we get to that agenda item. Okay, here we go. So first off, I want to just highlight some assumptions that are made, and I'll, I'll, I'll preface this by saying there are many assumptions. Again, we're really early in the, in the process here. And I have to move all your little faces here so I can see my screen. Um, so some of the assumptions, we have a number of positions this year that we did not fill. Uh, that were budgeted for because people left for a variety of reasons after the budget was approved and we chose not to fill those positions. We also do have at least one one year position that we aren't anticipating to fill next year. And that combination ends up being 9.8 FTE of effective positions that are cut without needing to riff anyone. So as you, as you look at these figures, know that that's there. And those are eight professional staff positions, one support staff position, and 0.8 uh, administrator positions. If this presentation also assumes that our equalized pupil doesn't change as a result of the hold harmless. That's not a for sure thing. The hold harmless is on our ADM or our average daily membership, which is a driving figure in a formula that produces our equalized pupil. Equalized pupil formula is really a statewide thing, so it could still have an impact on our equalized pupil count, which is really what matters most in terms of our spending per pupil. 
Um, but this assumes that that equalized pupil stays the same as a result of hold harmless. We'll see what our actual equalized pupil count ends up being. We do have a projected 966,000, or sorry, nine, yeah, 966,229 dollar of uh, fund balance from uh, from FY20. I think I put FY21, but it's really FY20. Um, and that's a result of several positions that were not filled. So um, we'll talk about my recommendation for what we do with that money in a minute. It does assume, you know, we have a projection on what the spending threshold would be, and we have some projections about what revenue will be. So those are some of the assumptions behind the figures you're going to see. So with that fund balance of about 966,000, my recommendation is that we place as much of that fund balance as possible into our reserve accounts, primarily the capital reserve. And we use whatever we need to from that to stay about $50,000 under the spending threshold. Some of the reason why I think we need to put that money into those reserve accounts, in particular the capital reserve, is we know the Mount Abe roof needs to be replaced. It does have some leaks that we're chasing currently. Uh, it's at the end of its life, and it's anticipated to be in the neighborhood of $750,000 to replace that. We also know the main electrical into Mount Abe is the same age as the building. It is in need of an upgrade that's anticipated at about a million dollars. Both of these items are on the capital improvement plan that has been shared in, in the past. Um, and those are obviously high dollar upgrades and, and re, uh, repairs. So to, to put this money that's effectively already been um, approved and paid for by the voters into a capital reserve to do this is a really, really wise use of taxpayer dollars. Certainly better than um, sort of returning to taxpayers at no, um, with, with no necessarily increase on that investment and then having to bond for that money or, or put this work off, which could end up costing a lot more than what's projected here. The other benefit to, to using as little as possible from this fund balance is when we don't apply a fund balance to offset taxes in one year, that means the following year, any money that we do use to offset taxes is sort of new revenue and it really helps us. When we use a lot of money from a fund balance to offset taxes and then in a future year we can't sustain that amount of money, that effectively becomes a decrease in revenue which really hurts us. With the hold harmless, FY22, with, between the hold harmless and the positions that we didn't fill, FY22 is looking in really good shape. That hold harmless for our, our decrease in pupils goes away. And in FY23, we're going to need to effectively be making up for FY22's drop in equalized pupil and FY23's drop in equalized pupil. Um, so FY23 is shaping up to be a really, really difficult year because we're effectively making up for the shortfalls of two years in one. Adding to that, you know, our, our home study enrollment, um, last year we had 31 students in the district that were enrolled in home study, which means they are unenrolled from our schools and we don't get to count them in our student count that produces our equalized pupil. This year that number's at 79. So it's almost 150% increase in our equalized, in our, um, in our home study numbers. So we hope most of those or all of those students return to our school system post pandemic, hopefully the start of next school year. We have no way to know how many of them will return. So that that's out there and, and it's a concern that would be in addition to the students we were already projecting to not have. So all those reasons, um, that's why I recommend that we use as little as possible of the reserve fund to offset taxes uh, or of the fund balance to offset taxes and put, the, put as much as we can into the capital reserve. So if we start looking at the figures now, and so with our current projections, we're anticipating that we would need to use about 100,000 of that fund balance with the hold harmless to stay about 50,000 under the spending threshold. I'm going to move the little boxes here again. 
So what you'll see here is, again, in light of those 9.8 FTEs that are not, that are budgeted in FY21, that are not moving into FY22, none of which require a RIF, uh, that equates to a half percent increase in spending overall and a 2.6% increase in our cost per pupil. Historically, those numbers are pretty favorable. They're, they're less than what I would say the last few years have shown in terms of increases in spending. And that, that does so with only using 100,000 of the 966 in fund balance. And so you can see in this scenario that puts us about 50,000 under the spending threshold. You can see here what that does to the tax rate. I won't dwell on this because really it's about the dollars that that, that produces that I think resonates with people. So again, oops, sorry about that. So again, we're looking at um, with that proposal of using 100,000 of the fund balance um, with the hold harmless, you know, in the upper 50s to mid 60s per 100,000 of assessed value. And as has come up in other conversations, it is about one third of Vermonters who pay their property taxes based on the assessed value of their home. It is true that when taxes per 100,000 of assessed value go up, for the two thirds that pay based on income, taxes also go up. They just don't go up the same amount. They go up various amounts depending on what the, what the family's income level is. Um, but there is no question that spending more on education equals increased taxes for everyone. It's just how much the increase differs. I wanted to also share with you because historically, at least last year, and I think maybe the year before, we've applied 500,000 of the fund bats to offset taxes. So basically, if we use the same fund balance year over year to offset taxes, that has a, a neutral effect on our revenue. I'm proposing 100,000 of the fund balance be used, which would have a negative impact on the revenue, but as you saw, it still produces spending per pupil and overall spending figures that are pretty favorable. But I thought it was important for you to see if we continued with past practice, we would be about $450,000 under the spending threshold. Our total expenses hasn't changed, so that's still a half percent. But instead of a 2.6% increase in equalized pupil, it's a 1.1% increase in cost per equalized pupil. And then you can see here, and I'll get right to the dollars. So what was a, a, an upper 50s to mid 60s is now in the mid to upper 30s in terms of dollars. So, so the difference per 100,000 is somewhere in the neighborhood of you know, 20 to $30 per 100,000 of assessed value. I also wanted to make sure to point out if we didn't have this hold harmless factor and we use the same 100,000 that we were talking about in that initial proposal, again, our spending hasn't changed. That's still a half percent increase. But the increase in the cost per pupil goes up to 5.24%. And now we're $565,000 uh, over the spending threshold. So again, without the hold harmless, this would be our reality. So we'd be talking about the 9.8 FTE positions that already aren't included. And we'd have to find probably another, I don't know, six, seven, eight positions more, depending on what positions we found to meet this budget target so that we can change that $565,000 in the red to 50,000 in the black. Those positions that we don't have to find this year because of the hold harmless get tacked on to the positions we have to find to build FY23 when the hold harmless goes away. Uh, so we'll continue to look to take advantage of attrition that's created um, to soften that. But I think it's important to foreshadow FY23 as we're talking about FY22, which is 
pretty typical. We tend to look a year out uh, beyond the year we're building as well to, to contextualize everything. And then to put that in perspective, and I'll get right to this point, this is what the tax rate would do. Um, again, this was um, in the same, same scenario with, with the hold harmless. This was upper 50s to mid 60s. Now you're looking at, you know, plus or minus 100 or, or even a little, little over 100 at the 107 in New Haven. This is before the tax penalty for overspending. When we add in the tax penalty for overspending, what was, um, and actually I take that back, it was the upper 30s, I think. Let me go back to the proper one. So this is the comparison, right? So upper 50s to low 60s. Now it compares to plus or minus 100 without the penalty. And then when we throw the penalty in, it's in the neighborhood of $140. So that kind of, I think, sheds a little bit of light on the impact of spending over the threshold, which is something we've talked about in concept. This puts some, some projected figures to that. So, so that's a pretty quick walk through our financial situation. If I were to summarize um, and sort of make my recommendation, which you can, you can think about and, and you'll have an opportunity for action in, in that agenda item in a few minutes. Um, right now, based on what we know, which for sure will change, um, really it's, it's use as little as possible of the fund balance and stay under the spending threshold by 50,000, which I think we can very reasonably do uh, with the positions that we didn't fill without the need to make further reductions. Again, there may be opportunities that present themselves or maybe other reasons to make some of those changes but they won't necessarily be financially driven for this next year. So I'm happy to answer any questions or, or hear any comments before moving on. And I'll stop sh screen sharing here. Patrick, could you just uh, clarify again what hold harmless means? So we're all on the same yeah. page. So the, the legislature took action to hold districts harmless for the drop in their average daily membership as a result of COVID-19. So again, that average daily membership or ADM is a really significant contributing figure in the formula that produces equalized pupils. And so that action to hold us harmless for what was what is actually a drop in students um, effectively buys us a year from having to make some pretty significant reductions. Having said that, we still made 9.8 FTE reductions effectively of positions. Nobody got sort of fired or rift, if you will, but we did lose 9.8 positions to be where we are in the position that we're in, which is a great position to be in for the one year. And then in year two, it catches up to us and, and compounds what would have been already challenges in that second year. Because the presumption is that hold harmless goes away and the drop, the actual drop in students for FY22 is added to the actual drop of students in FY23. And then in building FY23, we have to account for both years drop in students, which could be significant. Another piece that's looming out there that's going to be, I think, a focus of the legislative session that's coming up is the waiting study. The, that could potentially, I think the earliest it could possibly take effect would be FY23. So that negatively impacts us. Early projections sort of back of the napkin was potentially in the neighborhood of 1.5 million to the, to the negative in terms of an impact on, on our budget building. So that could be on top of another couple of million. So we, we, I mean, it's not, it's not unrealistic to think that we may be looking at a three to $4 million reduction in spending for FY23. Dave, did you have your hand up? So um, 
The first is about the impact on taxes. So the, the only people that are gonna be paying by the penny rate, which you show there, um, are households that have a household income in excess of 125,000. Given that uh, the average uh, in Addison County household is around 60 to $75,000, you could have instead of that column or next to that column, you could say this, this would uh, impact a family making a household with 75,000 of income. This would be such and such a, a dollar tax increase. And so that would be applicable to many more of our citizens than that number about uh, how much a $100,000 value house would increase. My, my, uh, my second question is, uh, or my question is, uh, at one point, uh, there's a revenue in one of the graphs you showed, and it's kind of been a roller coaster. I think in in 18 it was 800,000, and then it to the plus or minus, and then the following year reversed the sign from minus to plus, and and then and then again in the following year, and then this year you show, uh, I think, a minus half a million dollars. Why the roller coaster and and what's happening at the revenue side? Yeah, I would say that the there are multiple factors. The two main factors, and I would say they make up the lion's share. And Floyd can weigh on in win on us too. The amount of educate of special education spending is significant because the amount of special ed spending has a is a significant driver in the amount of special education revenue we get. And that ebbs and flows. So I'm thinking about out of placed student, uh, out of district placed students. It's not unrealistic with transportation and tuition, et cetera, that a single out of district placed student could uh, incur as much as two hundred thousand dollars a year in expenses. So you take two or three students swing one way or the other, and then you factor in that we get ninety percent of extraordinary costs that exceed sixty thousand uh, reimbursed that has a significant impact on what our revenue would be year over year. The other driving force would be what we do with a fund balance. So you mentioned the half a million dollar swing this year. We applied 500,000 in revenue uh, from the fund balance last year to offset taxes. I'm proposing 100,000. So there's a 400,000 swing right there on the revenue side. So those are the two, the two driving forces. I don't know if you had anything to add to that Floyd or concur. No, I think that's the the clearest explanation. Thank you. And Krista, you had your hand up. Thanks. Um, so I, I had a couple of questions about the Capital Reserve Fund and what's in it now. And if we put that amount that you're recommending in it, um, would it cover completely the roof and electrical at Mount Abe? So we have, have about 600,000 in there right now. We haven't had to touch that yet. Uh, and if you recall, the capital reserve fund requires voter approval to spend money out of it. The education reserve fund, the board has authority to spend. Capital reserve can only be spent on, on facilities improvements. Ed reserve has a lot more latitude in what it can be spent on. So. They, they serve different purposes, have different um, procedural aspects in terms of how they get spent. Um, but we have 600,000 in there that was placed in there, I think two years ago. Last year we put money and created the Ed Reserve. So we didn't put any in the capital. If we put, let's say we put 800 of the 966,000 in there, that puts us at about 1.4. We're still short of the electrical upgrade and the roof we can get one or the other done with that money. Um, and maybe if we use some of the general fund dollars to supplement it, we could get both done. Um, in all reality, we'd wanna be prioritizing um, what gets done when. So if we can get one of them done one year and we have money still in that reserve fund that we could hopefully grow in the second year, that may be another approach to get the other project done. And and there are many, many other projects. And unfortunately, almost anything you try to do in a 170,000 square foot building costs you about a million dollars. I'm coming to grips with that. <laughs> um, 
whether it's HVAC upgrades or electrical upgrades or et cetera, uh, they're just, it just comes with big dollar uh, signs attached to it. So yeah, I guess that's the short answer. No, it wouldn't get them both done necessarily. Maybe if we, if we use some of the general fund as well, we could, um, we'd have to sort of weigh everything else that we're trying to get done with the general fund dollars with that. Steve? When you say general fund, Patrick, you're talking about the million dollars we normally put in the budget? Yes, exactly. Dave? Um, let me see if I can remember my question. So um, I, I completely support putting the money in the capital reserve. Um, uh, I had a question which slipped my mind. So I'll raise my hand again when it reoccurs. I'm here all night. <laughs> no, no, we're not here all night. <laughs> Krista. Um, I, I have a comment, I guess two comments. One is that I think it sounds like if we if we do what you're recommending recommending with the capital reserve fund where we're making a significant effort in Mount Abe as a building. And so I think we need to recognize that um, in light of our planning process. Um, and then the other thing is in light of the need to get off this call in a reasonable amount of time, um, I'm not sure I'm comfortable setting a budget target. I feel like this is a lot of information to digest. I still have some questions. Um, and I'm just wondering how that hamstrings your process if we don't set a specific target tonight. Um, it hamstrings it pretty significantly. Um, because otherwise it basically shortens the window in time by a month for me to hit whatever target it is you're setting. Um, historically, the, the target has been stay under the spending threshold. I mean, it's been relative, almost that simple. I think that kind of a statement is all I would need to know that that's what we're going for. If the board was comfortable making that kind of a statement, then that satisfies the need. If the board was thinking be a million under the spending threshold, that's very different and and not having that additional month to try and hit that target would be problematic. Okay, that helps clarify. Sarah McLean. Yeah, I wanted to just um, echo what Krista was saying, you know, we're over two and a half hours into this like very compact meeting and this is the budget proje projections are gonna dictate where we're going with the future, all these conversations we've been having with our community. A lot of the attendees that had uh, been, you know, watching this meeting have left. And, um, and I just, I would just like to make a note and my brain stops working after two and a half hours, just moving forward. when we, when we talk about budget projections, if we needed its own meeting, um, I, I would, um, I would support that. But yeah, it just it, this has been a compact meeting, and it, this seems like a very, very important action item. Um, so, and I'll try to clarify. So, I I provided a little bit more information tonight than I typically would in October, um, simply to be transparent and share. Like, this is what we think is that. Like, you don't have to make any decision about what to do with the fund balance right now. You don't have to like. And again, these are super. These are projections on top of projections. These are going to evolve as we get you know, tidbits of information from the state in sort of drips and drabs. All we really right, need right now is a direction. Like if, if the direction from this board is stay under the spending threshold, that's all I need. You don't have to weigh in on you. Like we can make decisions later about use of the fund balance, et cetera. I just wanted to plant the seed, let you know what my thinking is, let you know what we think the numbers look like and to start that sort of process in the back of your mind of thinking that over. Um, there's no hard decisions tonight. It's, it's just, I have to have some direction of where to go. Sarah LaPerro. So can I make a motion to have the budget stay under the spending threshold? You can a little bit when we get to that action. Item. Okay. That's all you. <laughs> and um, Steve, you had your hand up. I remembered. Uh, H you mentioned HVAC as projects needing to be done. Uh, did we get or are we expecting to get uh, some uh, federal fund pass throughs to deal with HVAC issues in the district? And what's that going to amount to? 
Yes, we are. And I'm not remembering off the top of my head what those dollars are. Maybe Floyd has it off the top of his head. I, I, we're in the $160,000 that, that we're going to get reimbursed. Um, we had projects in excess of that approved that we could have gotten um, money for, but the, the pipeline is too narrow to accomplish these projects by December 30th. Um, so that money isn't going to be available to us to, to use for us to get these projects. It's, it's a problem across the state, not just us, that the bandwidth for the HVAC um, contractors is really tight. So basically, because we can't get contractors to complete the work by the end of December, those federal funds can't be used, which is unfortunate. And, and to give you a perspective, again, sticker shock, right, on a big building, we got 160000 in this grant toward HVAC, which is great and it's helpful. Floyd, how much did it cost to clean the ductwork at Mount Abe? Uh, 86000 So that gives you a sense of Thank how you. far 160 grand goes in a building that. In, and and our, our, our thought process runs along the, these lines that we can buy hardware now through this grant and we may not be able to get it the labor side of it worked through the process and we're, we're looking at how can we move monies around um, to to pay for that labor um, on the other side of december 30th um, as a as a as a responsible use of of the resource, meaning let's let's spend the money on the expensive hardware side, and then look to um, go ahead and, and do the installation on the back side. Okay, thanks for that info, Patrick. Do you want to take us into the timeline so we can keep moving? We're running out of time again. Yeah, and I I, I apologize. I didn't. Um, link the timeline but really i think the the most important piece here is i'll walk you through it quickly so you'll get an updated presentation in november we'll have a little bit more info than we had tonight um, you would then get another update in december and then finalize a budget in january part of the conversation that i think the board needs to have and you don't have to decide it tonight you can be thinking about it and it can be a decision at a later date is um when, with what frequency and at what point in time do you want to engage the community around this the FY22 budget, knowing that you have larger community engagement efforts around long range fiscal planning um, to, to balance that out with? Uh, so to be thinking that, and that might be something that the community engagement committee wants to consider and, and advise the board that way. Um, but we'll just want to be thinking about dates and points in time when we want that to happen so we can start getting those books. I just posted in the chat, even though I'm not supposed to, the, the timeline we had last year. So people can see that. And do we want to replicate that? So that will now have to be included in the meeting minutes. That's fine. Yeah. We can do that. Speaking for myself, I'd rather have more frequent, shorter meetings. Uh, I, I really fade after a couple hours. And uh, instead of trying to pack so much into our monthly meetings. Okay. All right, I'm gonna keep moving ahead. And um, now we're down to board management and governance. Um, to accept the monitoring report. This is the monitoring report from last month that Andrew completed. So is there a motion to accept the monitoring report for 4.1 governing style? So move, Steve. Second, Sarah. Thank you. Any further discussion? All right. All those in favor of accepting the monitoring report for 4.1 governing style, please say aye. Aye. Does Kevin have a comment? Aye. Kevin, are you saying aye or you have a question? Uh, okay. <laughs> Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you, Andrew, for doing that. 
Next is an action item to set the budget target. As Patrick said, the budget target could be as simple as staying under the threshold. Sarah, did you have something you wanted to say? I think that I make a motion that we set the budget target to be under the spending threshold. Okay, that's I'll second, and Andrew. Andrew, any discussion? Rob. All right. Uh, this being my first first go around, is that is that a, a number that's set in stone already? The spending threshold, out of curiosity. No, no, no. 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 The, the spending the threshold, threshold set by the state, by the state. not uh, anything we have yet. Our equalized pupil number is also set by the state, and we don't have that either. So there, there's a lot of information that's not set. Basically, nothing's set in stone right now. Even the fund balance is not audited yet. Uh, everything you saw basically tonight is a projection based on the information that we have. I guess a follow up then, um, do you guys anticipate any any curveballs um, coming from the state general fund and ed fund shortfalls? I know they look better than I think were anticipated from what I've heard, um, but is, is there going to be some curveballs coming? I, I guess I would respond to that by saying I expect a breaking ball of some sort. I don't know if it's going to be a curveball or a knuckleball or a screwball, but we always get something. We don't usually know what it's going to be. Um, and we'll do our best to hit it. I don't know what our batting average would be right now, but, um, but I think it's fair to expect something. Um, because historically we have. One thing we know, for example, there's this budget assumes a 15% increase in healthcare premiums, which is initially what we were kind of thinking in terms of, you know, with the higher cost settlement that, that ended up happening at the state level. Initial projections are saying that, that we could probably be safe budgeting something lower. So we'll continue to take a look at that. So health insurance tends to be a bit of a curveball. Um, although in this case, we're, we're feeling pretty good about hitting that curveball um, in light of what we are hearing. We'll see what actually happens. But that's that's one like that. That could be, a, I don't know, a fifty two hundred thousand dollar swing right there going from 15 percent to 10 percent. Okay, any other comments? And that's sort of why I recommended that we use as little fund balance as possible. I couldn't tell you specifically how many dollars of the fund balance we should use right now because there are still too many moving parts. Andrew. The only thing I want to add to, to this, uh, Patrick, is that I like scenario one. I'll call it scenario one. You didn't number them, but the fund balance, I mean, I, I think that's smart given a really old building that needs a lot of work. Okay. All right. So the motion on the table is to set the budget target to, at um, for Patrick and his team to be under the spending threshold. All those in favor, please give a thumbs up or say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? All right. That one. Okay. Next is an action item on the career change incentive. And before we take any action, Pat, Pat, Patrick's gonna give us a recommendation. Yeah, so I wanted to be able to set the context with the budget conversation to feed into this. And I think in, in years when we knew we needed to reduce many positions, we've utilized the career change incentive as a way to generate attrition so that we could avoid the impact reducing people, um, riffing, firing, however you want to think of that has on an organization. As I think I've laid out, we are not anticipating a need to reduce, enforce, or fire anyone this year. So because of that, my recommendation is that we not offer the career change incentive. And when I think about this in the larger context, in anticipation of an FY23 budget building process that doesn't look very promising, this tool for creating attrition is more effective in FY23 
if it's not offered in FY22. When we develop a habit of offering this career change year after year after year, the more consecutive years, the less effective a tool it becomes. So for all of those reasons, my recommendation is we should not offer the career change incentive at all to anyone this year. Patrick, how many people took it last year? I forget. Well, I'd have to take a look. Um, I'm kind of ballparking in the six-ish mm -hmm. that you're saying, Floyd. Yeah. And again, we do tend to, when we replace positions, they tend to be less costly. And it, it it's often it's often a wash, if not slightly, to our advantage financially when we do replace people who choose the career change incentive. It's it's very much a win when we offer it, someone takes advantage of it and we don't fill a position. So it hasn't, it's costly, like the, the career change incentive is expensive. It's two thirds, uh, it's the equivalent dollars of two thirds of the employee's salary that they apply either, either they get in sort of a cash out over, is it three or four years? I can't recall now, three years. Or they can apply some of those funds to pay for health insurance, or they can apply some of those funds to buy what's called airtime into the retirement system. And each of those, they can split the money up in a few different ways through those options. And, and those options have different impacts on our budget, right? So when all two thirds of the salary, which could be you know $60,000 or, or close to it, um, comes in the form of airtime, that's a one-time payment to the state teacher's retirement system when we feel that pinch in the first year. When it's a cash out option, the, the hit financially is spread over three years. So that's easier to account for. Uh, and then the health insurance, usually it's, usually it's not the entire amount applied to health insurance. Usually it's a portion there and a portion in cash if they're gonna do that. So. So it costs some money um, when we do that. So there's some risk in offering it because we we may not see that kind of savings. Historically, though, we have. Sarah McLean. Patrick, do you anticipate that there are any uh, staff members that would like to retire after this year um, that are waiting for this this incentive and? I, I just wonder, it's already like a highly vulnerable time for specifically older staff members um, that I would, I understand that it's a, it's a tool that we can use in our budgetary process. And also I wanna just consider the people that might, may have been holding out for it um, through this very challenging year. Um, I don't know that I would say no, I, I haven't learned anything directly as a result of COVID that has necessarily sparked an interest in this. There were a couple of people last year that came to me asking if it would be offered next year. Um, and I very clearly said, there's no way to know that. And every time this is offered, we make it really clear, like, don't base your plans on expecting this to happen every year, because that will be ill-advised. Um, having said that, I think, yeah, some people rolled the dice last year and decided, you know what, I, I'm going to work one more year in thinking, in thinking that they would get the career change this year. So that's probably true. They made that decision. If that is true, they made that decision against my advice. Um, and here we are. Dave had his hand up. I move we don't offer the career change incentive this year. Wait for a second. I'll second, Kevin. All right, Kevin. Any further discussion, Liz? Did you have a question? No. Okay. All right. Not seeing any hands. All those in favor of not offering the career change incentive this year, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So there was one that was opposed, Chris, and no abstentions.
And before we move on from this, it, it's related to the career change and it's related to the budget for context purposes and questions have surfaced around this as, as in our larger conversation um, in answer in trying to answer some questions that have come up. We look back the last five years and over the past five years and knowing that in one year we intentionally did not make any reductions in staff. So really it's four of the last five years we've reduced 36 point something FTEs in MAUSD. And that's before the, the 9.8 that I just talked about for FY22. So, you know, we're in the, we're in the neighborhood of 45 um, positions in a five or six year span that we've reduced to, I think that helps talk a little bit about the fiscal restraint that has been exercised over the years. Um, and I think it helps inform what the next several years could bring and what that looks like and could feel like. I think it's also to contextualize it by saying projected FY22 spending is 4.8% higher than FY18 budget, uh, which I think also helps to our, and again, one of those years was a six point something percent increase in spending. So I think that tells the bigger story about the fiscal restraint, about efforts that have been made to be responsible with taxpayer dollars and um, our ability to foreshadow financial challenges and, um, and the work that we've done to overcome those challenges. Sorry, that's a little, little, would have been more contextualized in the budget conversation, but I thought it was important to get out there before we left. Thank you. All right. Um, we're moving on to the update from the Community Engagement Committee. And Krista, you want to add anything? You're, you, there's a link to the update. Yeah, and um, I just wanted to point out, and I'm, I'm not sure if she's still on the call, but I wanted to point out the revised timeline that is referenced um, that it takes into account um, that we've decided to survey the community after Patrick um, provides his recommendations to the board at our special meeting. And, and when you look at that timeline, you'll see that it includes community engagement to happen after that time, after that special meeting and also the survey. And so while it's still a work in progress, what that engagement will look like, I just wanna make sure folks know that that we will be providing additional opportunities for dialogue with the community, um, which will also be accompanied by, you know, hopefully some more tangible information that accompanies Patrick's recommendations. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that we've gotten lots of great feedback from the board and um, from Rob's wife, Meredith, on the survey. And with this new timing, um, you can see the draft that we've put together um, there's still some wordsmithing that needs to happen with it and um, still a couple of, of lingering questions. Uh, but I just wanted folks to um, be able to see what, where we're headed with that survey, which is to um, first identify for people what the different broad options might look like and um, provide a little bit of context to those options and get them to provide feedback on on those without having them tied to a specific recommendation. Uh, then we'll, we'll ask people to um, prioritize the educational, the core educational values that were articulated last fall. And then we'll ask for feedback on the specific recommendations. So it's deliberately laid out that way. Um, again, there's still some wordsmithing that needs to happen. And um, you know, trying to figure out that balance of making sure people have enough information to really understand an option without um, creating this really burdensome text that most folks are like not likely to read in. Um, I I think, and you know, Rob may may want to add other comments on there on the survey as well because he and I have been working on this. I think what. Um, what we would invite people to do considering the time and where we're at in the process is if you have any additional feedback on the questions to please email those to me. Um, but the last thing I wanted to mention is that we are 
going to do this both electronically and a paper version. Um, and it will be turned around pretty quickly after Patrick makes his recommendations because we're going to have to send things to the printer and you know that takes a, a little bit longer. We'll probably do the um, electronic version um, you know, right after the survey is finalized and then um, the paper survey will come out a little bit after that. And Patrick has offered to have um, some of his staff to help us with data collection and, and that part of the process, which is great and much appreciated. Um, and we can, um, we can figure out what information we wanna put in video three over the next couple of weeks, I think, and then get that yes. rolling. So that, yes. so that people have the information they need for the survey. So they kind of have to be relate, uh, linked, I would say. Yep, yep. Sarah? Yeah, um, I'm curious, is there is there ever gonna be an opportunity for the board to have a conversation about the feedback that we've received from some community members or um, debrief on the town halls, some of the questions raised, some of the emails we've received, uh, the op-ed and the Addison Independent. Um, that's one question I have. And then I also um, am curious of how the community engagement is collaborating with the facilities feasibility study. Um, and if there's, if, that if there's been any collaboration that has happened yet, um, I'm just kind of, the, the timing is, is you know, the train is moving, has left the station. And I, and I don't know, it seems like we have the facilities feasibility, we have the administration, we have the community engagement. And I'm wondering when these seemingly siloed processes will, will unite and, and then we can have a more comprehensive, um, I can have a more comprehensive vision of, of, of the work that's being done. Could I, could I, I could speak to that. We have been, I mean, Kevin was at our last meeting, right? And or was that the, that was the uh, community meeting, but so their meeting is Monday and we'll wait. I'll be watching that meeting. We'll wait until after that meeting to certainly start creating video three and what information. So I think right now we are um, engaged. The both committees are engaged together in getting information out and, um, but we don't have all the information yet, so there's we can't get it out till after that meeting. Um, so I think we are working together because um, we slowed our process way down to to make sure we meet what's happening in the other areas. If I could just um, add to that a little bit as well, the um, well, first to your first point, Sarah about. Um, how we can incorporate some of the feedback and letters um, from different community members. That is something that I would like us to talk about, which is to see what space we might make available for um, community partnerships and creative um, approaches to this. And that's a longer conversation. And I think, you know, clearly we're out of time tonight, but one that I think can be talked about first, maybe at the community engagement committee. Um, and, and right now we've, you know, like the video scripts and the town hall presentation, um, Kevin has been providing information from his committee to inform that work and how it's shared out with the community. And I guess once his work concludes, we're kind of bringing that into um, together with Patrick's recommendations. And then that's what we're gonna go back out to the community with to get additional feedback. So it's um, it's kind of like a par it's it is sort of a parallel process, but it I, I guess the community engagement committee is charged with getting the information out, and so as much information as that committee has provided, we're trying to get it out, um, and that's about the level of collaboration at this point. Well, and the other thing to point out is that the community engagement, Krista, Kevin. Patrick and I meet every every two weeks and talk with Sue and go over things and work, you know, work to integrate all of our information together when we're doing work. So it's not something you see in the front of the scenes, but it's going on behind the scenes regularly.
Kevin. I I would just add that um, you know sometimes I think there's too much weight being put on what the feasibility committee is doing and, and it acting as an independent role. It's kind of a hybrid committee in the sense that it's 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 um, working for Patrick almost, if you will, not the board. And um, ultimately we will make a recommendation and he may or may not choose to um, concur with that recommendation based on what he knows and what we offer as our rationale. So um, we, we um, are, are locked as Don said and Krista alluded to, we're locked we're locked in and trying to synchronize what our activities are and not go too fast or, or too slow. But at the end of the day, um, I'm, I'm a little concerned with the conversation that, you know, we frequently remind each ourselves that um, the committee's in an advisory role. It's not, it's not a determining role. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving along because we're, oh, Sarah. Yeah, uh, I guess, I guess maybe possibly part of the confusion was in the second video um, that pointed to what the uh, feasibility, facilities feasibility was doing and um, and I have heard concern among uh, a community member of that committee that said that um, that it felt like it was a misrepresentation of what the facilities feasibility study was was there to do and was able to do given the information that they were privy to. So you no know, no financial information, um, for instance. And so I think that's that's more of of what I'm interested in hearing is, is it seems like we're, you guys are, I, I had no idea you guys were meeting every other week, which I think is incredibly valuable. And that, that sounds like a very productive bridge between these three bodies. Um, but yeah, but, but I guess I speak from a uh, concern of, of misrepresent, like I, I don't really understand the, what the facilities feasibility study is doing. I'm just, I'm basing it off of, you know, what information uh, Kevin and Sarah have presented thus far, which it seems like we're waiting on a lot of, uh, we're waiting for the, the meet, next meeting to happen. Um, and yet we're presenting to the community that they're do, they're working towards something. And, and I, and it's not a, it doesn't sound like a shared understanding. Kevin. Well, so I, I understand the, the concern you have and, and we, we develop and, and the explanation is that we developed this matrix that was supposed to uh, enlighten us on helping us make a decision. And in a lot of ways, um, it's brought up the complexity of the problem. But um, the, quite simply, um, the description that was talked about in video two was nothing more than that matrix and a bunch of fancy words. So, um, and it, if it's misleading, that's unfortunate, but it basically was talking about the aspects of the matrix that we've been working on. Okay, I'm gonna keep us moving along. Kevin, do you wanna update on your work? <laughs> <laughs> sure. So um, we we met in October and kind of honed in, honed in on, well, and are planning to um, complete um, the verbalization or or the discussion of the three charge questions, if you will, that we've we've admitted that we're going to work on, um, and that will probably be a working meeting, an interactive working meeting that we will have inputs from the three or the whole committee. I'm sorry, not on the three questions, and then we will work through and and wordsmith them and ed editorialize them to the group's liking. The option matrix, um, everybody has given their input and we're in the process of consolidating all that input, which will be presented at our um, November meeting. And, and, and I'm, a, I'm thinking that that's pretty cut and dried and there might be some discussion on, on it as, as we um, 
look at a couple different options of how to communicate that information. But the bulk of our upcoming meeting is going to be the consolidation and discussion, I believe, of uh, how we want to craft a response to those three questions for Patrick. And then um, with, with the goal of having those questions finalized and the matrix finalized, we've, pr pr we've pretty much come to the point where um, we will have made it clear as to what our concept of the solution might be. And then beyond that would be some sort of um, report out or deliverable um, that was expressed as a desire by the board last month. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Not seeing anybody. I think we're all winding down. All right, um, legislative update, Kevin. Do you have anything really quick? Um, just the uh, regional meeting for Addison um, District was held um, earlier this month, and Dave Sharp was elected as the new representative. Um, and then the annual meeting is this Thursday at uh, 5 p.m. if anybody's interested. And I guess the only question I have is uh, at that annual meeting, the um, all the boards will be voting on the resolutions. And um, my thought is to vote along with the board's recommendation unless somebody has identified um, a way that we should be voting as a board um, on those resolutions other than with the VSBA board. I'm seeing some thumb, thumbs here and there. So the Career Center just had everybody on the board send their uh, votes to the chair by email. Um, and they compiled what they thought was the, basically just gave that information to the representatives so they could have sort of understand what the board's general feeling was for voting with or without, you know, with or against any of the VSBA recommendations. People want to do that, I'm fine, and then I'll send it along so that that the representative will, will know. So I, I would only I would need that information uh, Thursday afternoon by I don't know four o'clock or something I guess. Okay, so in the next week, send it over to me, and then I'll I'll pass it along. Okay. And unless I hear otherwise, I will vote as the board recommends. Okay. All right, and then Dave, you were going to give us a brief update on the VHI Visbit meetings. Yeah, so um, I went to the VHI annual meeting. It was over in 15 minutes. It was uh, pro forma. Um, everybody agreed with everything and we signed off. I did not go to the VISBIT meeting. I had a conflict and I think it was uh, essentially the same thing. All right, thank you. I should add, actually, that there'll be Laura Sorrells has been uh, the executive director or lead person at VHI for quite a number of years, I think 10 or 15, maybe even longer. Um, and um, she's retiring. So they introduced the uh, new individual and um, he's coming, I forget his name, he's coming from uh, Maine and New Hampshire. and. Um, uh, moving over to Vermont and taking over responsibilities of being the director of VHI. Okay. All right. Thank you. Chris, um, in just a, like a minute or two, we're going to get to the survey. Are, do you have the ability to, to bring that up? I don't know if Chris can hear us or talk, talk with us. Yes, I see you. Okay. But be, while, while that's getting answered, um, I need to fill out the board response form and I just need some thumbs up really quickly about the monitoring reports for the ends that we accepted. Did, did you find that um, the superintendent's interpretation was reasonable? Can you just give me a thumbs up? Yes. Okay. And did the data demonstrate the accomplishment of this interpretation? Okay. Great, thank you. I forgot to do that. All right. Um, I don't believe we need an executive session, correct, Patrick? All right. 
Okay, is there any public comment? If you have a public comment and you're an attendee, I guess you can use the electronic hand raising function. Yep, Herb's had his hand up for a while. We'll see, I think this is hopefully it's still relevant. So Herb, you should now have permission to speak. Uh, do you hear me now? Yep. Okay, so uh, this is gonna be a little jarring, long meeting, um, appreciate your stamina. Uh, if I had been um, able to, you know, tap into the meeting at the beginning, I would have had uh, uh, made some comments around uh, Patrick's update around the strategic plan. Um, I appreciate, you know, the district certainly choosing as a couple of priorities, you know, one of them being uh, the um, aligning the commit curriculum with uh, proficiencies and standards, you know, because I think it has the potential to raise uh, the standards for our curriculum. And I think that's, I think that's a great thing. Um, um, some of the questions I would have wanted to hear was to what extent, you know, um, students are actually learning under a standards-based curriculum uh, right now, you know, at the different uh, schools, the different core subjects. Uh, it wasn't really clear from the information provided. The other question was, you know, and I'm assuming that that's not uh, fully implemented. Um, and I guess the second question was, would have been, uh, is, um, you know, when the superintendent would anticipate that uh, some sort of proficiency-based or standards-based curriculum would be fully implemented. And if there are, you know, some delays, you know, uh, I think it would be important for the board to know why, what, what the difficulties the superintendent has in, in fully implementing you know, this kind of curriculum, this updated curriculum. But here we are, end of meeting. Good luck, folks. Thank you, Herb. I just wanted to say, I'll do highlights for this meeting. So much happened. The last few, I was working on the video and it was hard for me to do both, but this one, definitely, I'll get that out to Patrick by Friday to look at and Don. Okay, thank you. All right. All right, um, we're done to the meeting evaluation. Chris, are you able? I don't think that's gonna happen. Chris, you should be able to unmute. That's helpful. I'm not going to spend a ton of time, I guess. So, oops. I have it open, Don. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Uh, so today, 1027, 2020. What is the level of engagement of all board members, high or low? Thumbs up for high, thumbs down for low. I'll say hi. Was the agenda followed? Thumbs up for yes. Thumbs down for no. Yes. Is the chair effective in fostering a professional culture regarding fair and open deliberation, full participation of all members, and ensuring the integrity of the board process? Thumbs up for yes. Thumbs down for no. No, no. Okay. Any comments we want to add to that? Moving on, other feedback for chair? Any Thank comments? You. Say again. I do have a comment. I, I think the board needs to form a uh, program facility fe feasibility committee. We spent a whole lot of time and energy on a facilities feasibility committee. Uh, I think that it's uh, we're gonna be asked as a board to make a decision between facilities and programs and doing that without a, a much more complete understanding of what the programs are is going to be extremely difficult. We ought to have a program feasibility committee. Thank you. Dave Sharp says, 
we should have a program feasibility committee. And I think Sarah McLean had her hand up as well. Okay. Um, just maybe have two meetings or just not have such packed meetings if at all possible. Possibility of two shorter meetings instead of one longer one. Okay. Any other um, feedback was, for the chair? It was good that the meeting agenda was followed, but it was too bad that the meeting agenda was followed. <laughs> okay. Went to, what went well with the meeting? Agenda was followed, Steve? <laughs> Okay, anything presentations, else? The presentations. Yeah, Good presentation. The presentation was, was wonderful. And the presentation for the, the strategic plan and uh, was, was, they were wonderful. Okay. Good presentations. Okay, what suggestions do you have for ways to improve future meetings? I think you got that with the two shorter meetings. <laughs> okay. None see above. Okay, that concludes our survey. All right, is there a motion to adjourn at 921? So moved. Andrew, is there a second? Second. Kristen. All right, all those in favor of adjourning at 921, give the thumbs up. All right, any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, thank you everyone. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good luck, Caleb. Good night.